I just want to start out by saying uh, welcome back to all those who were uh, just reelected. Congratulations! Bravo! Bravo! Um, yeah. So I'm gonna call this meeting to order, uh, and the first thing is to uh, review and approve the agenda. Uh, so, are there any? Changes folks have in mind for the agenda. First thing is to swear people in. Oh, okay. Well, let's do that first then. <laughs> John, you want to uh, take that away? Uh, sure. All our three winners, please raise your right hand. And I have to click away to see the oath. So if you make faces at me, I'll never know. All right. <clears throat> um. Sorry, one moment. Here we go. And again, there's two oaths because Vermont wants to know you really, really mean it. So, okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the constitution or government thereof, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yep. I think I heard all the I do's. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of council member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law, so help you God, or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yeah. Great. You are all back in. Yay, congratulations again. Um, wonderful. So uh, I'm guessing that folks don't have any changes that they want to make to the agenda. Any any comments on that? Okay, uh, I do see uh, some members of our uh, legislative delegation here and we are so delighted to have you. I uh, just want to, I mean, you can see the agenda um, for yourself just, but uh, just to let you know, we have some um, uh, process things that we need to take care of first and then some appointments and then we'll um, we'll get to, to chatting with you all. Uh, so um, anyway, next up is, uh, well actually there were, there were no changes to the agenda, is that correct? Okay, so without objection we'll consider the uh, agenda approved and so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an issue that is otherwise not on our agenda. <clears throat> and if you have something uh, to say related to one of the agenda items, we'll talk about that uh, just uh, adjacent or part of that agenda item. But if it's not related, now is the time. If you could say your name, uh, where you live, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be fabulous. So any anyone have uh, comments that uh, they would like to make? Oh, and you can um, raise your, you can actually physically wave or you can use the raise hand icon uh, or, um, okay, yep, I see you there, um, Edward Cremo, thank you. Um, and uh, I think there's another way. I think those are probably the best. Uh, yeah, if you're on a phone, you can unmute yourself. It's star six. Yep. yep. Stephen, did you want to make a comment as well? Yeah, I'll go second. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, uh, Edward, go ahead. Hi, I, I just feel that it is appropriate in view of the fact that nobody knows me um, and I do not intend to be a voice in, in your meeting, but I am a resident of Pennsylvania and I am considering coming up to your neck of the woods and I was looking at the town website and I noticed that this meeting was going on tonight and I thought it would be a good way for me to get a taste of the political scene up there and so I just thought it would be inappropriate for me just to have my name there and not identify myself. I will also I'd take this opportunity to congratulate all of you re-elected council people. Congratulations. But I'm going to go back on mute and just listen for a while. Thank you. Okay well thanks for introducing yourself and we're so glad to have you here as a part of this meeting and uh yeah, hope that you end up making it up this way. Um, all right, thank you. Um, Steven, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I want to apologize to Edward for our website, uh, city website, uh, but that's another story. It's a, a long-running uh, issue. Um, at the last meeting where I spoke, I raised the issue of uh, minutes. Actually, I filed a notice of violation of open meeting law for not having the minutes of the police review committee up on the web. And somebody seems to have you know, John Odom at least responded and said, I'll look into this. But that triggers a, a five-day response, uh, an official five-day response. And no one bothered to respond to my notice of violation. Nobody bothered to tell me that we've, you know, created some minutes afterwards. No one bothered to send me notices of the upcoming meetings uh, or the meeting that was held in the interim. Um Despite my requests uh, to to one of the members of the committee, Lauren, Councillor Lauren, but I, I'm concerned in that, for instance, the uh, agenda for the Montpelier Police Review Committee is dated the 24th, and it doesn't have a time meeting on it. Uh, there's some draft minutes there from. February 22nd, but how how could you have moved the meeting two days prior uh, to the date that the agenda, or was the agenda crafted after the meeting? But when you've got minute, draft minutes from the 22nd and you've got an agenda for the 24th, something's a little out of whack. Uh, you've got two agendas up for tomorrow and for the next day, and I, don't, I really don't think that it, somebody's taking this seriously, and then I get a snarky, you know, response back to request for the recording uh, from our city manager that says, we don't record it and we don't have to. You know, it's like, this is this is not a trivial exercise. This is a very serious matter where we're trying to right-size our police department and, and find out where the accountability is slipping. And we can't even keep proper records or warn meetings properly. Is uh, it's pretty atrocious, and I humorously uh, noted to Councillor uh, Richardson today. I think all this stems from the fact that we're a .dot org instead of a .dot gov, and so we're behaving more like a slipshod nonprofit than uh, a municipal government. Um, and maybe it'll just be remedied when we get a new website and get our domain uh, straightened out to a .dot gov. Uh, that's enough for now. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Bill, do you want to uh, address any of that? After, um, after he provided us the information, we went back to make sure everything had been posted properly and asked that it be done. He asked for recordings of the meetings, and I told him we don't record them and reminded him that we don't have to, so he's correct. Uh, but we believe everything's been posted, but we will go back and double check it to make sure we're doing everything properly. I, I believe I'm still due a response to my notice of violation within five days. You know, this is ripe for Superior Court, and I just think our, we're flying in the face of uh, our very important foundational public records and open meeting laws. Okay, thank you, Stephen. That's, uh, that's been noted, and uh, we'll follow up as appropriate. Um, so, all right, anyone else? Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. And uh, so now we have some organizational items that we need to address. We address these every year uh, at the start of a new session. So since we just had town meeting day and um, we're just swearing in uh, just about half of our council, um, now's the time to do these things. So, uh, 
actually for each of these, um, I'm going to turn this over to Bill to uh, walk us through. Unless, um, unless you don't want, I mean, they're, they're, I think they are pretty self-explanatory, but um, it's okay. if you have any, anything you want to say about them, go ahead, Bill. No, ma'am, but I'm happy to do it, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, okay. So the, uh, the first item is electing officers. We typically, you typically elect a, and in fact, according to charter, you elect a president, a vice president, and a parliamentarian of the council. The president presides at meetings if the mayor is not present. The vice president presides at meetings if the mayor and president are not present. The parliamentarian, of course, makes rulings uh, on parliamentary procedure as the year goes on. Um, so those are the, the offices and their roles. And uh, in all fairness, occasionally the president or vice president also will get called in to pinch it if the mayor's out of town and there's a some sort of ceremonial event. So um, they are sort of the second and third in line of the elected officials. So typically one of you nominates someone and then you go through the process of making elections. So I think we should probably uh, do this in order here. Um, so, <laughs> Just oh yes, Jack, go ahead. Oh, Jack, we can't, I can't hear you for some reason. Well, I was going to ask, who are the officers now? Well, that's a good question. I was sure who was vice president. Uh, I was. I'm also not sure who vice president was last time. Donna, I thought you were president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I you thought never go away, so I don't get to do anything. But <laughs> that's true, um, especially this last year. Um, Dan, go ahead. I was just going to say, Jack was vice chair, uh, okay. vice president, and I was parliamentarian. There you go. Oh, you mean you um, were official? <laughs> <laughs> so one question is, um, uh, I'm going to not necessarily assume that folks want to uh, be those same roles, or there may be other people that are interested in those roles. Um, but just to... Uh, have a process here. Uh, I'm going to ask each folk or each of those who were the, in that role if you are interested in um, continuing. Um, Donna, are you interested in considering continuing to be right? But I was also willing to trade with Jack if he wanted to be president. He expressed some interest last year, and when I talked to him earlier, he wasn't sort of decided. So, and Jack, what do you think? For my screen, Jack, where did you? Oh, he's having trouble with his computer. Oh, well, I wonder if we should wait because I, if, I, yeah, if Jack's not, clear, he's not here, I don't see, I feel like Jack has unfortunately left the meeting. Maybe out of respect for Jack, we should move on uh, to one of the other items. That it doesn't remove other people's interests. I didn't mean to shortcut other people who might be interested in any of these positions. I, I think oh. he should be here if we're going to. He's back. Oh, Jack, you're back. We we can't hear you. Still, still can't hear you, which is curious. Hmm. And we have no chat function. Or we, hey, maybe we Jack, do. nod your head. Do you want to be president and I'll be vice president this year? There we go. Okay, so Jack is interested in being president. Is anyone else interested in being president? Okay. Um, is, and so, okay, Connor, yes, what's up? Uh, so do you want to be in? Uh, move to nominate Jack as the council president. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Yep. okay. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And Jack, are you thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> After a very bad start here, if, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it work. Make it work. Um, all right. And, and actually, to be fair, I'd like to do all of the nominations together just for expediency. Um, so uh, is anyone else? Um, Donna, you're interested in vice, vice president? Right. But yes, I am. Okay. Is anyone else interested in vice president? I'm happy okay. to let Donna continue. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, Pontarian... Uh, Dan, do you have interest in continuing on as parliamentarian? Uh, I'm happy to do it. It's a weighty responsibility, but um, as we can see in the U.S. Senate, it's an important function, so I'm happy to do so. True. 
Is anyone else interested in um, being parliamentarian? Okay. All right. So is there a, a motion? Should I move to nominate the whole slate there? Yeah. Okay. Besides Jack. Move to uh, nominate Donna Bates as Council Vice President and Dan Richardson as Parliamentarian. I'll second that. Okay. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Sorry. And Jack, was that a thumbs up? That's a, that was an aye. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, uh, Donna, or Jack and Donna and, and Dan for stepping up into those roles. Um, certainly appreciate that. Uh, all right, so rules of procedure. Uh, so these uh, are not any uh, different. I actually, Bill, I'm gonna, anything you wanna say about rules of procedure? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say for the rules of procedure, the ethics policies and the group norms uh, typically, well, the, the last one is new, but the, the rules of procedure and ethics policy, we typically, you typically adopt each year, even though they don't change much but it just puts on the record that this group of seven has seen them, read them, and adopted them for this year to, to follow. So there's no question that people have had the opportunity to review them. I will say that for them, for those, I did tweak them a little bit. So there, there's minor changes, but it's just to reflect the, the practices that we've had. There's nothing substantive. So, um, you know, and I didn't remember afterward till afterwards to do the sort of cross out and strike out. So I can provide that if you want to wait, but there really isn't anything uh, that's that's major changes uh, with those. And the same with the group norms. Uh, that was something we started adopting about three or four years ago. And some of it was dated. So I just took out the stuff that was older that, and to just reflect the current practice. Any, uh, uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I, I don't have a, any comment. I was actually going to offer a, a motion. Um, I mean, I did read through the materials and I didn't see a, an issue with them. They're consistent with what we've had before. Um, and, you know, to the extent I didn't particularly find where Bill did a tweak or not, but, um, but that's generally because I think they just made sense and um, any changes were not major. So I'm, I'm certainly comfortable with it. And, uh, I'm willing to make a motion that we adopt the uh, city council rules of procedure as proposed, the ethics policy as proposed, uh, and the group norms, the council policies and standards uh, as proposed. Okay. And we need to uh, adopt the uh, city council handbook. No, that's informational. That's essentially, okay. uh, you know, kind of a, an orientation uh, mm -hmm. item for you just to re we update it's been updated to reflect this year's information normally if this were in person we'd be handing you your copies for the new year um so we will we for those that would like hard copies we can make those available but they are you have the link to it okay uh so there's been a motion and a second any discussion on those three items Okay, uh, great. So all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. okay, and I saw Jack raise his hand. Um, and opposed? Okay, so um, all of those uh, passed, rules and procedures, ethics policy, and the group norms. Uh, just for the sake of... Um, Again, expediency, I think we should move the committee assignments until after we uh, hear from, or uh, after we do the other appointments and hear from our, our delegation, if that is all right with everyone. Um, I think that probably makes sense. Uh, okay, great. So uh, we have some appointments to make um, to the Homelessness Task Force, uh, the uh, Conservation Funding Committee, and to the Central Mont Public Safety Authority and to the library. Um, and so for those, um, we have, uh, well, again, I, I think we should hear if, if folks are present, 
Uh, we'll hear from all of those candidates now. So that's uh, Nia Klammer, Dee Dee Brush, uh, Doug Hoyt, and uh, Graham Sheriff. And I'm just going to check to see if we have any of those folks uh, with us. And I don't think that we do. Doug Hoyt is here. Oh, Doug Hoyt. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. I even saw you previously. My apologies. In a winter wonderland, even. So, <laughs> um, Doug, would you uh, like to uh, just introduce yourself to the council? Although I, I know um, many of us uh, know who you are, but uh, nonetheless, if you would uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your uh, interest and connection to the CBPSA. There, got to got to do the mute. Uh, my name is Doug Hoyt. Um, I've been a Montpelier resident for pretty much all of my life, um, and uh, probably more in line with what uh, this appointment would be would be to uh, return to the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, my 40 years in law enforcement, 26 as uh, uh, chief of police, I think I know a little bit about what's going on with the area of communications, which is the uh, foundation uh, of the Public Safety Authority. Uh, I would hope that I would be able to lend my experience uh, to the endeavors of the uh, authority. Plus, that allows me to keep down a company. So. Well, you might want to mention you've served on this board before. I kind of thought I did that, but... Okay, I, I may have missed it. Sorry. It's all right. I sometimes miss things, too. It happens when you get a little older, Donna. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, I, I served two years on, on the authority, and uh, I was uh, thinking of leaving altogether, but I subsequently changed my mind. The... Um, the one thing that's in front of the authority is the uh, opp opportunity to work with a um, reputable vendor to really make some significant changes to the uh, communications. And so I, I think that's going to be a big step forward for not only Montpelier, but Montpelier, Barry, and, and, and hopefully um, other communities within the region. Any uh, questions for Doug? Yeah, Donna, go ahead. Certainly. I just want to mention uh, Doug's been an outstanding contributor. He's been very generous with his time and expertise. He's been an at-large elected member in the past. Um, so I would just hope that you would support this appointment. Thank you. All right. Any other um, of the uh, uh, applicants here, Nia Clammer, Dee Dee Brush, or Graham Sheriff? Okay, uh, so we can either um, go into executive session or we can um, stay here, what, whatever um, you think is best here. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Oh, you're muted though. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we've adopted a policy before of wanting to go into executive session. So I'll make a motion that we go into executive session to consider the, uh, the appointment of these, um, these particular nominees uh, for these positions pursuant to 1 VSA section 313. Second. Hey, there's a motion and a second. And so any further discussion? Uh, so just, oh, I, I guess we should probably vote first. Um, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, just so everyone knows, this line will stay open. Uh, the counselors are going to disappear for a little while, and we will be back shortly. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and uh, is there, oh, so, 
opposed. Right. Okay. Is there a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion. I, I move that we appoint uh, the following individuals to the following boards. Uh, Dee Dee Brush to the Conservation Funding Commission, Doug Hoyt to the Central Vermont Public Service Authority, Graham Sheriff to the Library Board, and uh, Nia Clammer to the Homelessness Task Force as a student member. And you meant to the Public Safety Authority? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. okay. There's a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, um, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, well, thank you uh, all for your, uh, for your time, for your service. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I just want Doug to leave. I need to ask John Odom to do the oath for Doug. The Public Safety Authority Charter requires that they do the oath before they can take their place on the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Board. Sure, you're going to have to give me a sec to pull it back up because I think I closed the window with the oath. You think I'd have that memorized by now. I'm, I should have given you a heads up of the possibility. Sorry. That is all right. It won't take me but a moment. Well, I was going to say it feels like uh, deja vu all over again to be March and at a to be have it be in March at a city council meeting with Ian Cummings and Doug Hoy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hang on just a sec. Almost there. And Mary Hooper, too, although I don't see her. Okay. All right. There she is. Okay. Uh, I can't see you right now, but if you would raise your right hand, Mr. Hoyt. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the constitution or government thereof, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of Central Vermont Public Safety Authority member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. You are duly sworn. Thank you. Thank Good you, Mayor. Thank you, Thank you, Doug. Awesome. We appreciate, uh, again, your uh, your commitment to the Public Safety Authority. Um, all right. Well, I think we are up to uh, checking in with our uh, legislative uh, delegation here. Um, now, we have a we do have a committee dedicated to that. Um, and I, I know we are certainly interested in hearing uh, an update from uh, from you all as to how things uh, stand and um, how things are progressing, but uh, I also want to give our uh, legislative uh, committee an uh, opportunity to, to say anything um, before we jump in here. Connor or Lauren or no, you're, no I, you're... I, I would just say it's been uh, e excellent having this subcommittee. First off, we're trying to keep tabs on what's going on under the dome. And it's really opened up great conversations with our legislators who are Really grateful to come in. Um, I think we teed it off okay a couple months ago at the beginning of the session, uh, but a lot of moving pieces, definitely with the uh, the COVID packages coming down and a, a few different items. So I'm not sure if we have any specific questions from the committee, but would just love to hear an update. So thanks so much. Yeah. So if if you have uh, any updates for us, we um, yeah I'd love to hear them and any just weigh in on behalf. On behalf of the committee, when we when we last talked, I think the committee was interested in hearing so what the big issues were, obviously, for the legislators, uh, if there was anything that we ought to be aware of or that we could be helpful in. And then, um, obviously, if there were things that on the agenda that we approved that we've shared with them that we ought to know about or if they could give us an update on how they're moving. Obviously, probably not every specific thing on the item on the list, but. Any, any general comments we wanted to check in? It's sort of, in theory, midway through the session, so we hear how, how it's going from everybody. Well, go ahead, uh, uh, Anthony, and then Mary. Hi, you can hear me okay? 
Yep. This is kind of a random one, actually, but last time we were here, we talked about, and I know you talked about it otherwise, about giving more power to local municipalities. Um, and we drafted, <coughs> sorry, we drafted a bill last year that was intended to do that sort of a pilot project where a certain number of towns or cities would be, local municipalities would be given the ability to change certain laws, make decisions on their own. We looked at it again. It, we, we passed out of the Senate last year. I went to the House and it basically didn't come out in any real way. So we were looking at doing it again in the Senate. This is not a happy ending to the story, I should warn you. <laughs> um, we looked at it again in GovOps, Government Operations Committee the last couple of weeks. And we realized that in putting together the, the uh, pilot project for what towns could do, we were under a lot of pressure to exempt certain things like the towns could do anything they want to do, but as long as it doesn't have to do with the environment or it doesn't have to do with guns or it doesn't have to do with water quality, it doesn't have to do with, you know, police, doesn't have to do with setting uh, speed limits, whatever. There was this whole list of things you couldn't do as part of this, but uh, as part of this plan to have you do things. So the more we thought about it, the more we decided that we have to put that aside. Um, and we're going to instead probably look at the proposals that are, come before us that would allow towns to make changes that to their charter or to their laws if something has already been accepted by the legislature once if, if the town has asked for a charter change to do x y and z and the legislature said yes it would mean other towns could be able to do the same thing without having to go through the whole process so we're looking at the possibility of changing the the um, charter process more than anything else i just thought you should know that because i know it's near and dear to a lot of our hearts to try to give more power to the localities. And we, we, we talked about it amongst ourselves and with the Mont League of Cities and Towns. And basically, we, by the time we were done talking about it, we just threw up our hands and said, there's no sense in doing this because we have a pilot project that allows you to do anything you want to do as long as it doesn't include anything important. So we're rethinking wh where we could go with that. So I put that out there. Yeah, Connor, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, sure. Uh but along those lines, Anthony, I uh, was watching the House floor today, and it looks like uh, the non-U.S. citizens voting charter passed, uh, change passed, uh, 103 to 39 in the second reading there. So expecting it's going over to Senate government operations soon. Do you have yeah. any sense of if we're in better shape uh, than we were last biennium? I think um, we might be in a little better shape because of uh, a little bit of a change in leadership, quite honestly, that might make a difference. Um, I mean, I'm not telling stories out of school to tell you that last time the pro tem didn't like the idea. Um, and that made a big difference as we, when we talked about it in caucuses and whatnot, you know, it's hard to argue against the pro tem who doesn't want to bring something up. Um, this time, I think we might have an easier time making that happen. So again, not promising, but I think I, if I had a guess, I'd guess we're in a little better shape than we were last time. And we were in pretty good shape last time. It wasn't like we were overwhelmingly, people were not overwhelmingly negative, but there were just some people who were saying, no, we don't want to do this. And they happened to be people that had a lot of sway amongst the, amongst the caucus. So I think we may be better off this year than we were last year. Great, thank you. Um, Mary. Well, so Connor stole my thunder. I thought, yes, I can tell you we did something. It was good. And he even told you what the vote was. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it is, you know, we'll do a third reading tomorrow and it'll head over to the Senate. Uh, John did a really nice job testifying in House GovOps and the GovOps committee did a really nice job on the floor. And um, yeah, so that was great to see happen. I guess maybe the other things that I, I can just mention that I'm thinking about, so you know that I'm on the appropriations committee and we're kind of right in the midst of getting a bill out that is changing on a seemingly da daily basis with the new federal money coming in, we're trying to sort out what does that mean in terms of the state budget. But in one of the things we have thought about is that um, municipalities writ large are, are going to see a really substantial amount of money. And there is a sense that 
not places like Montpelier, which are large and ish and well, really well managed and, you know, have resources, but little places are going to need help figuring out what to do with the amount of money coming down. So we're trying to think about how to put some technical assistance in um, for both municipalities and probably working with the League of Cities and Towns and the Regional Planning Commissions. And um, similarly concerned about um, education districts, you know, having the resources to figure out how to make smart decisions. And I think that's going to be added to the um, COVID recovery bill that is now over in the Senate. So that may be happening fairly quickly. Um, and we've all, I mean, every, I, and I'm sure you all have, uh, certainly Bill has resources that are trying to tell him what the federal package may be. Um, and I talked with some of you this weekend, and in fact, it's less money coming to the to the communities than we had thought and more going to the state. Um, but it's just all, it, it's all being sorted out and it's going to take weeks and weeks to really understand this. One of the significant things is unlike the last 1.25 billion that the state received, which came very rapidly and we were able to deploy very rapidly, this new money, which is over a billion dollars, um, is going to come with, um, they're going to write rules and regulations. And in fact, the state may have to apply for the money. I'm assuming that may be similarly true for the municipalities. So it is not going to happen as quickly. We are um, easily two months away probably from being able to get that money out there, um, other than the money that goes directly, you know, in terms of unemployment insurance payments and other supports that are going directly out there. Um, but sorry for talking so long, but what we experienced last year is going to be different than what I believe we will be experiencing this year. And it's changing daily. So what we thought we knew is changing constantly. So I have a couple of questions about um, that. So uh, I'm curious about uh, whether or not the, in the, either in the COVID relief package or in the funding that's going, <clears throat> the state um if there are if, if there's going to be money carved out for um, um well or or any kind of um protections against uh, evictions or those who may be in jeopardy of losing their homes huge amount of money coming down for rental assistance more money than we are going to be able to spend which is really frustrating we're trying to be very creative in terms of figuring out how to hang on to it and um but some of the restrictions are that it, at least with the 200 million that we got in January, which ha was allocated out, it is only available um, for um, households that are at 80% of the area medium income. So it's, there's a, a lin income cap on it. It's not dealing with evictions, but it is dealing with rent support or vouchers. Um, so there are restrictions. And again, we're trying to be um, resourceful in terms of, of figuring out how to hang on to it. But there is a huge amount of money coming in for rental assistance, but in restricted categories. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. And then backing up a topic, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on uh, what we, you were saying about uh, the money coming to municipalities. So your, your anticipation is that for a, a city the size of Montpelier, that the guidelines that you were talking about, um, may they may not apply to us? Um, or, or do you think those guidelines that you're that are, you know, mainly being crafted with smaller municipalities in mind still may apply to us? No, I, I was one just trying to say that broadly there is a concern yeah. about providing technical assistance to municipalities and school districts so that they can 
take advantage and wisely figure out how to deploy this money. I see. I so do not know what guidelines or restrictions or process there is at all for the municipalities. They are just what we do know is what we received last time is not the way it's going to be managed this time. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. That that makes sense. So uh, so that was technical assistance that would be available, um, which we might not necessarily need. Um, no, so the state is talking about what can we do to help municipalities and school districts get ready to take advantage of the federal money. So we may put state resources to so that you are positioned maybe not just not on Pelier. Again, I think you guys are good at this, but that other municipalities are well positioned to take advantage of what might be happening. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's helpful. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, just related to your question about renters, Mary, is this new rent? Like could some of our homeless individuals use it? Um, does anybody else know on this one? I have, well, oh, yes, I think, uh, yes, but so the challenge, I, I believe the answer is yes, um, but the challenge is, again, um, finding housing now that is, that fits, and Anne may know more about this than I. Thank yeah, you. Go ahead, Anne. Um, you're, you're muted. muted. Okay, I'm too well behaved. Um, I think it was at Money Chair somewhere today, um, I heard that the issue is again, finding the housing and we are doing everything we can to get more housing. And that some of it, we can't use it to pay the motels, but some of the motels do a month long lease and that might qualify as rent. So all I can tell you is we are working as creatively as possible just to, to get as much money out there and on the ground and doing as much good as we can. Great, super. Um, anything else you wanna um Add in. I know you had your hand up. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the technical assistance part, um, I chair finance and finance, the schools got some major grants the last time and they weren't all used. And we had some discussions with the head of the school um, finance directors about why, you know, um, and some of it was just concerned that if they didn't do it right, there might be a clawback um, that, uh, you know, Montpelier in a national standard is pretty small in a Vermont standard. We're big and we're sophisticated. Um, but you get out into some of the smaller communities and they don't have the resources. And I think that's the technical assistance. I think we all know one-time money is one-time money. And some of the concern is you, since there's so much pressure on the property tax, you could use one-time money to buy down your property tax for three years, and then it goes away and your property tax jumps and you have nothing in the end except a falsely lowered property tax. So I think we're trying to think through what kind of capital investments. We're thinking about HVAC systems in schools because we have schools in some serious disrepair. We have public buildings. And so that, you know, just to help communities think through when we finish this, what are we going to have? Because after two years, Mary's going back to the same gap um, between revenue and expenses that has been chronic. Um, 
on you were talking about old old times with Doug and myself being here. I was doing flashbacks today. Um, we had the municipal utilities in, and they are asking for some flexible rate stuff. And um, the proposal was to require that they come in for a rate hearing every so many years. And I said, John, I'm having flashbacks to when I we have to take charter changes up to the legislature. And they told me the people of Montpelier didn't understand what they were voting for, and they were going to fix it. And they were going to give the mayor the right or obligation to vote on every issue. And um, I told them, please don't help us any more than we had to. And yes, the people, how big was the print? So it's the be careful what you ask for, there's a risk. But it got into the discussion of kind of our attitude towards the municipalities. I think you heard it with Senator Polina. There's a tendency to not trust that you know what you're doing. Um, and that's interesting. The other issue that came up today that might be of interest is last, I think the Friday before we went on town meeting break. So we just took it up this week. We got a bill uh, going back to the old Senate position on marijuana sales revenue. And right now, I guess the towns will get a fee to be set by the state and can be used, but um, it's set from what we heard today to cover your cost. Um, any revenue will fall to the state. And then I guess we can decide if you get it. And this bill um, sponsored by Senator White from GovOps um, goes back to the Senate position of last year, which is the 14% uh, excise tax. 2% of that would be dedicated to go to municipalities that have a cannabis establishment. That is the new term of art which is growing, manufacturing, labs, or retail. Um, there is apparently another cannabis bill. Be, we have to have all the bills that came directly to finance out by Friday. Um, this is crunch week, and um, I'm not sure if we'll get that one out because we can probably find someplace else to put it. Um, but that's one I thought you might, it's called a Christmas tree and I like to decorate. Um, you can usually find another bill to hang something on, but um, that one is out there. Um, and this seemed to get fairly sympathetic hearing today, so we might get it out. That's really good to know. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, Bill, go ahead. Just quickly on, on, not on the cannabis, but when you talk about the funding, I certainly can appreciate the desire to help cities and towns and school districts with technical assistance. I hope, I guess I just urge as a general matter that whatever flexibility can be built into the funding, um, please do. You know, the, the, I appreciate that we might want to do HVAC systems and all, but really the, the ability to let a school district or a town decide where their priorities are rather than have those set by the state, I think would be really helpful. We have we have a long list of infrastructure things and things that we've delayed as a result of COVID. Um, and you know, they may or may not include HVAC, but they're just as they're they're important to us. And um, you know, we we didn't lower our taxes, but we didn't raise them this year because we cut all enough out to cover for our lost revenue. So yeah. whatever no. we can put back. So I just urge as much flexibility as possible to, to let the local establishments uh, I think make those decisions. Flexibility is prime with us. Um, it's the feds that frequently make it difficult, but I think we understand uh, part of this COVID discussion today was you know, towns have been under so much pressure in the property tax that 
they need a new source of revenue to do things like fill potholes or uh, just any one of those things. I think the concern is because some folks are afraid, um, you know, these get highly technical. Our joint fiscal office has been working for weeks trying to understand, and we still don't completely understand <laughs> what's the strings are going to come with the federal money to, to make sure that the assistance is there and understanding what you can and can't do. The administration has actually hired a consultant guide house that does that initial vetting as to whether or not this proposal for spending money um, would meet the criteria. Um, so we've got help and I think we're just trying to give some surety to local towns that what they're proposing is going to meet, you know. Well, I think the technical assistance is a great idea. It was more to the extent that the state is shaping what towns or school districts can use the money for. It would be, uh, but the, I think help. Try is not to. HVAC came up because of COVID and that was one place we specified money was, I know Montpelier, when my children were there was known as a Petri dish. And it, um, Donna probably remembers, we did a major um, air quality <laughs> investment in the high school because um, there were concerns about the quality of the air in the school. Um, Lauren, did you have a question related to that? Yeah, just on this topic. So uh, this is all really helpful to hear. Um, also hoping, and I've talked to Representative Hooper a little bit about this, but um, that part of you know technical assistance is great. Also thinking about matching funds, you know, given the, that most of the money is going to the state, and how can you know could municipalities leverage bigger projects because of the kinds of you know, I understand it sounds like it's going to be weeks as you dig into what the different pots of money can be used for. But once that is kind of sussed out, um, you know, obviously with water projects and transportation projects and efficiency and all kinds of things that we we want to do as a community and the state wants to do and meet state policy goals. Uh, just, you know, probably it'll be great to get back with you all in, you know, a month or six weeks or whatever. <laughs> it's the right timing. Um as you understand those state pots of money too, you know, so as making as smart decisions as possible for both what will eventually come to Montpelier, but also if there's opportunities for state funding for this one time that we could be well positioned to, um, you know, take advantage of as much as possible. I, I don't know if Mary knows yet, but initially there was a huge amount of money going to counties and New England, I think we decided we have two side judges and a sheriff, and that's county government. And um, and I don't, th there's been discussion about would that money come to, would it just not come here? Would it come to the state? Would it come to the towns? Would it, and I don't know, Mary, have you? No. No. You're on mute. Uh, I'm muted. It's I, I don't we don't know the answers to these questions yet. I mean, we're we're working off pieces of paper, not the, the bill. Remember, the bill has not even become law yet. So we're ways to go. Um Madam Mayor, will you take the comment on this? Um, yeah. Let's let's hold off for a second though, because I'd I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Andy from Senator Pushlick. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for for doing this again. I was just going to give some updates of things that I've either worked on or we've talked about in the past. I have four of them that I think that the city would care about. One on your list of legislative priorities was the restrictive needs that we talked a little bit about, and I did the. Quite a bit of research on it. It's pretty interesting. I had some interesting conversations with title attorneys and and lawyers and ledge counsel and stuff. The, there are states that have legislated fixes to this problem. It's not a 
huge problem. Like it's pretty rare. I talk to title attorneys that do titles every day, all day. And they said it comes up like maybe once a year, once every couple of years, but they are out there. And so uh, I'm going to work up a bill with ledge council because of you, the, the fact that you guys brought it up. Um, the question is kind of what, what do we do? One, a couple states have waived filing fees. So, so this would be something for the city to consider because if somebody came in and said, okay, I want to have a new title, would you, would you be okay with us waiving the fees that, that, that the city or town would normally uh, charge for that? And then I was thinking, is there a way for some people we could even get them the attorney's fees? Because I know man, maybe uh, Attorney Richardson would have an idea of there is like, there, there could be some families that find out about this, but just the, the effort to hire an attorney, to, even though it's a simple new straw deed, it's still, a, still hiring a lawyer. Hopefully lawyers would do that pro bono, but you never know. So that's an update, but I can answer any questions if you have on that, but I, we are, I'm going to move forward on that. Great, the Montpelier micro transit, we I organized a hearing today and Senate transportation went well, sustainable Montpelier was there and a lot of, uh, you know, good things were said about Montpelier and the micro transit or the my ride, I should call it. Uh, yes, Donna. And so, but the, the committee was really interested in, in this working out. And I think it's a really, you know, a good, a good mark on Montpelier that we were the pilot project for that. I think it's going to be great as it, as it expands. And I have a lot of confidence in, in that. There one homelessness thing there, there is some money for the good Samaritan shelter to buy a hotel. I don't know if you guys know about that. No, Mary, Mary says, no, it's not well, going through. Well, no, let's just be careful. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in the COVID relief bill, we um, put 10 million on the house side, we added $10 million of CRF money um, for, to Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Right. Um, we're, I, 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 we're deeply aware of, and they know that Central Vermont needs a solution. And, and it's really exciting that Good Sam has some ideas, but I think we, we are a few steps away. We need just to be careful about saying, yep, that's yeah. done. Um, but, but one of the, I mean, we're very aware of the need to create more housing and we're looking for ways to fund it. Right. I guess it's something that I'm, I, I was raised to, you know, something I'm aware of that I hope, I hope to, to make happen. Yeah. The other thing that you probably know about that we're, we're working on, we're going to pass a bill on the people waiting study. People call it the people waiting study, but it's, it's more than a study because the study already happened. So the way the state's education funding formula works with how pupils are weighted is going to change. And the way it's going to change is very likely going to mean it's going to be to raise the same amount of money in Montpelier, you would have to raise taxes. And you raise taxes and raise the same amount of money. So uh, I haven't looked at the model for Montpelier recently, but when I looked at it before, Montpelier is one of those towns that was going to, the rates were going to go up. So because other towns that have, that are either rural, more rural, have more poor families in the school or more families that are, uh, you know, English as a second language, they would, they would be able to raise the more money with the same amount of that. So it's something that, you know, the city probably just wants to, to be aware of as, as they're looking at property taxes on the education side. Um, and I'm, I'm, Still interested in district heating. If there's anything that we can do, maybe especially with the federal money, you know, it was the federal money that helped us build the district heating plant in the first place, the plant in the district heating. So, you know, this could be another once in 10 year opportunity to, to do something else there. So happy to work with this city on that issue. And I, the only other issue that I had worked on city related was the rail stuff. But, you know, I did some research and reported back and I think Hopefully we're okay on that, but if you have anything else that you need on there, just let me know. Yeah, that was really helpful about the rail um, from last time. So thank you so much for doing that, that research and getting back to us uh, about it. And, you know, as far as uh, district heat goes, I, I 
think that maybe a component of uh, the longer net zero energy 10 year plan that the city is um, contracting out right now. We haven't announced who our partner is yet for that, but we're going to be announcing that soon. Uh, and they'll, that partner will be helping us develop a, a, a 10 year plan. And we've, we've talked about how, um, the role district heat might play in that plan. So anyway, it's, you know, it's not an answer for right now, but it's, um, you know, hopefully more to come soon uh, on that. Uh, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, Lauren and then Dan, and then I, I know Stephen, you had a, a comment, but uh, we'll, we'll go in that order. Go ahead. This, this you might not know yet either. I was just curious if we know yet would, um, for the municipal money, do we know yet the timeline of when it would need to be spent by? No, okay. Well, um, like I had seen something about 2024 or other things yeah. for, for a lot of it, but I didn't know if that applied to this money as well. I, I haven't heard that it explicitly about this money, but the good news is that the federal money writ large is um, actually, a, some of it is out to December um, 24. So that's exciting. It gives us a much better horizon to make some good decisions. Um, and incidentally, given the district heat conversation and some of these others, there is also a pot of money for capital expenses. So that's exciting in terms of opportunities there. And I, I don't know what that means for the municipalities, but we're, you know, we'll be figuring out how to see how it comes down to you all. Um, and you know that there is also some, so there's pretty significant spending around broadband and we're going to put that one's real clear and I think we'll push it out a little more quickly. There's also some pretty significant funding for uh, water related issues. So this may be, yeah, this could be something pretty good for, you know, wastewater or water supply. Um, and boy, I bet Montpelier could spend, you know, whatever we're all getting for the whole state as is true of a lot of municipalities, but there's some really neat opportunities potentially here for us all. That's great. Um, I can go ahead and then, sure. um, and then just to check, uh, Senator Cummings, did you still have your hand, your, your hand? No, raised? And no then, I need to take it down. Okay, just thought I'd check. Okay, uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, I think I think two points. One is um, uh, I'm excited to hear about um, you know some of these opportunities for projects uh, or funding for projects at the municipal level. You know, certainly one of the issues that I I, I think is important is the the bathroom issue that we continue to sort of push forward um, both in the short term and long term. Um, and I've had discussions with constituents about that and creating different options. Um, so it would certainly be helpful to keep that on 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 the forefront funding for such projects. And um, the other part is, uh, you know, at least as far as the the county uh, spending question is a really interesting one because you're absolutely right that you know New England is not a county strong system, but you go you know really Pennsylvania on west and the counties play a major role. Um, and it doesn't necessarily translate. It's not like towns do the same things that counties do out west. You know, in Washington state, counties do more than what municipalities do. And then the Midwest, they do this mixture. But, um, you know, that would, I, I would certainly encourage, um, and certainly we'd be willing to help um, in, in thinking about this. But I think that, that a lot of that has to come to the municipality because um, all of these little towns are tackling a lot of these issues that are usually left to the county. So things like a senior center, um, you know, which might be, or a library system that might be run at the county level, it are really run by municipalities um, here. And so having those at the, at the town and city level are going to be really important as opposed to keeping it up at the state level. And I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to think about that. And I'd be happy anytime to testify about county and town differences, um, because that's, 
a near and near and dear subject to my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, first, I want to note uh, for the record in Kabin, we've got three of our uh, female mayors here on the line for this occasion. Uh, so that's that's notable. Um, so uh, secondly, I, I ask that we, if, if we're, for instance, going to get about four million, we were about a million and a half shy of the budget prep. And round numbers I'm hearing is that we're going to, Montpelier might see about four million from the local, uh, but I don't want there to be. I'm not sure the state will uh, legislature will have too much ability to put constraints on it. But I don't want to. I I, I want to second Dan's comment about public restrooms, and I, this is somewhat for the state delegation too. Is that we would be smart right now, especially until uh, most businesses get reopened to invest in some of these uh, trailers that have, uh, there's some with multiple stalls of bathrooms with hot running water for wa hand washing and similar ones for showers. And those are reusable in future disasters and hurricane type, uh, you know, Irene's or whatever. So those might be a good investment of state funds just to get us through the next year, uh, placed strategically around the state and around the city. Um, so that, those might be, if we're going to buy, you know, 40 of them for the state, that's beyond the Montpelier budget. But I don't want to see so much latitude because we've had, you know, we've been gridlocked here about even getting City Hall's bathroom or the transit center bathrooms open. It's it's a real tragedy in a public health emergency of people, you know, defecating in the streets and alleys. So, um, secondly, Wi-Fi and air circulation, uh, those are things that may or may not be within the ability of the $4 million that the city might see. Um, I'd like to see about half of that put into public works just to begin getting caught up. But air filtration systems for the public buildings, even for, uh, you know, Rabble Rouser or uh, I think City Hall with the proper air filtration could create some space where people could come and participate in a legislative Zoom meeting. I don't have the bandwidth to participate in legislative process. Some people may enjoy that uh, <laughs> uh, other than by telephone. And if I could go to city hall and use a zoom, you know, session and that would, that might be useful. Uh, so air filtration and wireless uh, capacity, even Kellogg Hubbard is, is spotty and breaks up regularly outside. So we, we have, we missed the boat on the DPS, Wi-Fi grants of free equipment, and we should not miss the boat now. So I don't really understand which of this should fall to the state, but I think we have an opportunity, and I say this to this dele legislative delegation, let's make Montpelier an example of how it looks when it's done right. And, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a small enough community as a laboratory to do it, to, to do Wi-Fi really right, to do air filtration and public gathering spaces for uh, that are safely distanced and air filtered. So let's, let's spend this wisely, but let's, uh, also address some emer emergency needs for just public safety and hygiene. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, any other comments, questions from folks? Um, Mary, did you have some, or Senator, or I'm sorry, Representative Hooper. <laughs> Mary, Mary works really good, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just wanted to mention, so we've been talking about this enormous amount of money that we're going to see. And in fact, we're already feeling um, the consequence of a lot of what we refer to as one-time money. So money that is not available for reoccurring expenses. And um, you know, it's the same problem you guys have. You have to budget out years and think about, you know, you don't want to make commitments now that you're not going to be able to um, uh, fulfill in future years. And um, I, I just wanted to mention that notwithstanding this huge amount of money that's coming in, we're also going to be making really um, 
challenging decisions and you sometimes may be scratching your head and thinking, they have so much money, why aren't they doing X or Y? And it has to do with um, being constrained by the nature of the money. Um, uh, uh, we, we just really try hard not to make ongoing commitments if we only have the money for a year or two to pay for it. Um, and Ann mentioned earlier the gap between our revenue and our expenditures, which is annually on the order of um, 50 to 100 million dollars that we have to figure out how to close um, or else raise taxes and not particularly happy to do that in this um, climate. So I just wanted to throw that other piece in there of just what, how we're constrained today. Thanks. So yeah. good to see you guys. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thank you all for, for coming this evening. This was really helpful. It's really good to know sort of how things are progressing and uh, where, where things stand. Really appreciate your, your time. And also thank you for your uh, commitment. I, I know you all are working very hard uh, for all of us. So we really appreciate that. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, any other thoughts, comments? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again and uh, have an excellent rest of your evening. And um, I, just thinking about like, are we planning to check in again at some point, uh, maybe when the session is, is over or I, I'm not sure that that is necessary. We can, we can chat about that and see if that, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, thank you again and, and have an excellent thank you. Um, evening. Yeah. See ya. Appreciate it. Good night. Okay. All right, and so we are, uh, we're at 7.45 and I think we are good to continue on here. Uh, so we are up to the presentation on the water resource recovery facility. And uh, so for this, I am assuming that I'm gonna turn it over to, um, oh, perhaps to uh, Kurt. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'll start by just oh. uh, introducing our Deputy Public Works Director, Kurt Monica, who I think is going to lead us through this. Uh, and our goals are really to give you an update on where uh, phase one is at, uh, the, the construction that's near the end. Um, I know we've been wanting to talk about the PFAS issue somewhat, so at least let you know where things stand with that. And then I think probably the most important thing is uh, moving f issues related to moving forward with phase two. Uh, energy uh, portion of it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. All right. Um, I did prepare a PowerPoint presentation. Um, do I have screen sharing abilities, Cameron? No. Hold on just a second. Sorry. You should be good now. All right. Okay, everybody see the first slide there? Yes. So this is actually a, a recent aerial view um, of what the plant looks like today. Uh, you can see in the back is, um, is our digesters that have been uh, a, a big improvement which will allow us to um, utilize the methane that we're gonna produce at the plant for alternative energy once we get to the phase two uh, component of the project. Um, so I'll just start out, like Bill said, there's really three topics on this presentation. Uh, we'll go through where we're at on the current project that's underway, which is the upgrade to aging infrastructure and the organics to energy uh, work at the plant. And then um, I'll pause there and then we can uh, open it up to questions on that portion of the project. Then we'll go through the phase two, which is combined heat and power. Um, which is electrical export to the grid um, with heat recovery off the engine of the generator. And then the last part of the presentation will be, um, like Bill said, just talking about PFAS and where we're at with the regulatory status. So jumping into it, uh, the overview um, for the OE, the Organic Energy and Aging Infrastructure Project, what we, we'll talk about what we've done, uh, 
the remaining components of the project when we expect to be complete, where we're at with waste hauler agreements, um, future work that was not in the scope of the project, and uh, the economics of uh, the upgrade. I remember the CHP project, we'll talk about the development work we've done to date, uh, how much um, financial investment the city has into the project currently, uh, the changes in the estimated project cost um, since we last spoke to council about it and our next steps moving forward. And for the uh, PFAS update, we'll discuss the, uh, the timeline on the surface water discharge limit, um, the uh, status of uh, the Coventry landfill with regards to uh, leachate regulations and uh, uh, any anticipated impacts from the organics energy project, the high strength waste that we'll be taking in. So starting off with our current project, the aging infrastructure component. Um, these are some pictures from the actual site uh, from our plant, the new equipment we have. Um, the upper left is our solids processing. That's what takes the water out of, of the sludge. Um, <clears throat> it's a great improvement. We're able to uh, run, we will be able to run this equipment um, essentially 24 seven. Previously, we had to have staff on site to run dewatering equipment. Um, and it's also producing a much drier uh, solids. So we're not uh, paying to haul uh, water to the landfill. Uh, the chain and flight system is the, the first set of tanks um, where the influent, uh, the water coming from the city, wastewater coming from the city is, uh, um, the solids are settled out. Uh, we've improved um, the way the, uh, the solids are um, managed. This is a much better system, um, much more efficient. So that's been completed. The, the grit classifier is, uh, separates the grit as it comes in um, prior to these settling tanks. And then there's been a lot of electrical improvements uh, to the plant. We actually had to shut the power off to the entire plant at one point in order um, to do some interconnection work. And you know our, our operators are really great through this project. They were able to uh, drain down tanks and uh, provide storage. Um, and we didn't have any uh, permit violations or anything related to the power shutdown or any other part of the project. Um, then just some other work, we've done sludge conveyor improvements, the, the heating and ventilation improvements at the plant. Uh, a lot of um, pumps have been improved, upgraded to more efficient pumps um, with lower horsepower in many cases, so we're saving electricity there. And uh, we added a, um, a fire alarm in the dewatering building. And then for the uh, the component of the project related to um, organics to energy, this is primarily focused around the solids handling compo component of the plant. So the digesters have been improved uh, with heating and, and high efficiency mixing, uh, which generates um, you know, more methane. And the picture on the bottom is the boiler. So we have now, we previously had one methane boiler. We now have two. Um, so that's, that's going to allow us to heat uh, just about the entire facility off methane. There's only one building that is not on the loop. It's a very small chemical building, um, but all of the rest that we, we expect um, the oil previously used at the facility to be offset um, through the methane production in these boilers. Um, <clears throat> other work's been done is we have a, a new tank that gives us sort of um, uh, extra space to manage uh, waste. Um, there's been a lot of uh, control work done uh, in order to manage the digesters and maintain uh, appropriate levels. And there's the new beast receiving unit, which screens out um, organic waste material like grease, which we could not previously uh, accept. So the work left on the project now, um, we're still working through some bugs with the methane boilers. Uh, in order to allow them to um, move back and forth between oil and methane automatically. Right now, we've had just a few glitches, but I think we're getting close on that. Um, the UV system, uh, the down, there's two sets of gates, one set of gates to isolate the two channels from each other, uh, and then a uh, set of downstream gates to regulate the, the level in the channels. Um, 
So that's part of the electrical efficiency of the project. So we've always, well, since it was built, the plant has had to run both channels because we couldn't effectively isolate them. Um, so that's uh, remaining work. Um, there's an issue with the downstream gates and we also have some leaking between the channels that we're uh, working through. Um, the, the balloon cover on the bigger digester uh, needs to be replaced. It was actually, um, it was the one that was installed is smaller than what um, ESG had planned for. So they're going to swap that out. It's not going to cost the city any money. Um, but that's probably the last thing to get done, which may be into June is what they're projecting. And then we have to do a final walkthrough and develop a punch list, um, which will include paving and other things. Uh, with regard to the um, high strength waste haulers, we've uh, council approved a draft contract and we've been negotiating price points with uh, various companies that haul waste. Um, the biggest one is Wind River which actually um, I'm sure some of the council has noticed there is uh, a new building out near the intersection of Route 2 and 302. Um, that is a, a Wind River, uh, that's Wind River's site for staging their trucks for hauling. And I think, you know, I think it's fair to say the uh, this project really um, prompted that development. Um, so there's some peripheral benefits to uh, what the city has done here. Um, so we have the... Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sorry, I should have jumped in a little sooner. When you mentioned that piece that was smaller than expected that wouldn't cost the city anything. All right, that's the digester two methane yeah. okay. torch cover. Okay. It being smaller, how does that impact the functioning? We just don't have, uh, it's really um, only an impact for the phase two projects. So we don't, it won't allow us to store as much methane. Uh, in order to really um, to make the power that we need to for economics on the phase two project. I guess I was thinking that for, that before it was advocated to go to something larger, and I can't remember what the advantage was, but there's a reason why it was initially designed to be larger. So is it going to impact phase two? Are we gonna well, have to we'll have it replaced before the phase two project starts. It's just a, a remaining where it's just an issue that came up during construction. Um, somehow, and I don't, it's really between ESG and their subcontractor, but um, my understanding from them is that uh, the cover that was delivered was not what um, was approved in their submittal. So, so, so it'll be changed for phase two, is that what you're saying? Prior to phase two, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. And so when you when you talk about this oh, river, what was their name again? Uh, Wind River. Wind River. That's the one out by the roundabout? Right. Yep. OK, because okay. that came up a couple times at the regional uh, transportation group. Very curious about what that group was. Uh, are there going to be some articles about it in conjunction with this project for the city? Um, I haven't planned on writing an article, but if that's something you're interested in, we certainly can do that. Well, no, I, I thought maybe they would be doing something to better introduce themselves and also it could feature our improvements. I was thinking it would be a mm -hmm. positive article for both us and how they've come in as a business and how this is also supporting what we're doing. So I'll just put it out there for you to think about. That's all. Yeah. Aaron, do you something you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to give some context. Wind River is the company that we uh, um, contract with for our Porta Johns. So, Donna, that's what they do. Just wanted to let you know. So that's uh, that's the company and what they what business they have is uh, Porta Johns. Well, it's it's bigger right, than that. Right, but they're bringing it to us. Yes, <laughs> they are. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's a circle. It's like. It, anyway, it was a very lively discussion in the regional TAC, so I thought we should own it. That's all. Yeah. Success story. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, so Wind River is really going to be, so they purchased Hardigan, who was an, another hauler that was uh, located in Middlesex. Um, they're uh, really our anchor um, client. They're going to, they, we have contracted with them for about 40% of the capacity at the plant. Um, so they're, you know, a large um, national company 
and then that goes to Vermont. <clears throat> um, and we have that signed contract with them. So they're, you know, they'll be bringing us, we anticipate, you know, the, the lion's share of the high strength organic waste. Um, we've also signed contracts with PMP Septic, also a company that uh, does Porta Johns. Um, and then the other ones are kind of in the works, all cycle waste, new tech, because there are other similar type haulers. So these are all trucking companies that take waste from places like Ben and Jerry's and Cabot and all those. Um, so we're not actually contracting with, uh, you know, the companies that produce the waste. It's the, it's the folks that hauled it for them that we're contracting with. Um, and once we get through um, all those remaining items, the last part is a measurement and verification. So as part of our contract with ESG, we have to document um, the changes in electrical use at the plant, how many, how much um, chemical use it takes to treat, and our um, change in water use, and <clears throat> as well as our tipping fee revenue, and compare all that to what the contract says. And if there is a shortfall, ESG is responsible uh, to cover that difference through the contract. So it is an ongoing uh, project that we just need to keep an eye on um, and run through those exercises you know, at the end of each fiscal year. Uh, can I ask, have you found it onerous to keep ahead of all that data so they can be responsible for any loss? We haven't really got into it yet because it doesn't start until um, the project's accepted. And that sort of starts the clock for um, the guarantee. Um, I don't think it's going to be a, a terrible undertaking. You know, the water is a meter. Um, we have actual, uh, you know, the, the power is also a meter and chemicals are fairly easy to track. So I, I do think it's, it's manageable for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Just for I, I remember there was something about this in the um, in the sample contractor that we had approved earlier. Like, how does it work for knowing what you're bringing in in terms of if some of some of it is business waste and other things? Like, are there what are the chemical? So, like we're talking about PFAS later, but just like to make sure that, that nothing hazardous or emerging contaminants that might be problematic that. You know, are they required to disclose every all the components from from the more industrial um, um, waste, or how how does that work? So we know, like, if there's the potential problems that we might want to get ahead of. Yeah, so they have to provide um, an analytical sample of each waste stream, and uh, each um, each type of waste has its own code um, in the receiving unit. So uh, they, you know, because they're all different price points. So um, say Greece, uh, they put in a code when they deliver the truck, that probably won't have an analytical um, breakdown on it because it's, um, you know, pretty predictable. But um, other types of waste like uh, dairy uh, can vary a lot. So we are requesting um, sample and lab results on those uh, prior to accepting that waste. So we'll actually be able to see the analyticals. Uh, there is also uh, a component in the contract to hold them liable if they're bringing us hazardous waste that disrupts the plant. So they uh, need to carry insurance if they were to uh, you know, cause issues uh, for treatment. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. That's very really helpful. <clears throat> um, and so we're looking at project completion in April. Uh, excluding that um, digester cover uh, replacement. But everything else, um, you know, towards the end of April, we should be wrapping up this very large, um, you know, largest one I've worked on here in my 15 years. So, um, and, uh, and I say overall, it's been a really successful partnership with ESG. So um, it was a good move and see in the, in the financial slide, which is next, um, well, the one after this one, <laughs> but that's uh, that we're doing. A, we're in good shape. Um, so, just a couple of things that is that were excluded from the project that will have to be done, at, uh, you know, at the plant improvements at the plant. 
There's uh, some bearings that need to be rebuilt on the big screw pumps. Um, it's really a maintenance item. We're planning to do that next year out of our operating budget. Um, the big ones, the secondary clarifiers, those are the big round tanks at the plant. Um, those were in the original scope and we took it out because of uh, concerns about the overall project cost and um, impact to ratepayers. It doesn't really require any design work. It's just uh, contracting the replacement. So that's something we can manage ourselves. That will be well, within the next couple of years, we'll be planning to do that work. Uh, the capital needs assessment identified um, a roof replacement on the watering building. Uh, now that we've invested so much money, we'd like to get the exterior lights uh, working again. Um, the secondary blower is really an efficiency project to reduce further electrical use, uh, as well as the septic tank mixing. We have mixing now, but um, there's a more efficient way that we'd like to do it in the future. And then of course the, the phase two project. Well, now the economics. Um, <clears throat> so the bond for the project was 16.75 million. Uh, we were able to get the USDA grant at two point, just under 2.59 million, the PC grant at 2.3, so almost 5 million in grants. Um, we brought Efficiency Vermont in uh, very early in the project uh, and sort of um, discussed with them equipment selection looking at efficiencies. So we do expect them to contribute to the project. They're still working through all the numbers and verification somewhere in the range of $50,000. Um, the other benefit to going with the, the USDA loan as opposed to the municipal bond bank is that the interest rate was really good. Um, so, you know, our projected cash flow when Todd uh, Preventure was here, we were looking at an interest rate of about three and a half percent. Um, we're actually only paying 1.8, so there's a you know a fairly substantial reduction in estimated annual payments. And then, of course, through the contract, the energy water savings is 200,000 a year, and the new tipping fee revenue is 255,000 dollars a year. So if you put all that together, um, it the actual debt service that the city is paying is very close to what we had identified as a very small improvement project in the master plan of three and a half million. Um, so, you know, that's good news. There's not not going to be, um, you know, a major rate hike as a result of the project uh, because of all the benefits to going with a um, energy service contract. And of course, the grant funding certainly help a lot. Um, and then on the upside, we do expect to have uh, bring in a little more revenue. The, the, these are all guaranteed numbers. There's the projected numbers are are higher than um, what's guaranteed. So I think they'll, they'll be upside where it could even be a little bit better than um, what we're budgeting now. So that's pretty much it on the phase one. Are there any other questions, comments? Or oh, that was very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kurt, I have a couple of questions. One is with that chemical building that is not going to be connected to the uh, methane heat, is that building heated otherwise, or is it a non-heated building? It is heated by oil. Yeah. And for the other buildings, is it, um, are, I, I'm sort of making the assumption that we're leaving the oil system there as a backup. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. So there's yeah, another, I believe we have four other boilers at the facility. Pretty much every building has its own kind of backup boiler. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, okay. I think that's it for me. Any other questions? I can't see everybody. So go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, jump in if you have a question. Could, could I jump in now? Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Kurt. Um, just on the labor piece, I guess I'd be remiss in asking, are there any future uh, construction contracts that you mentioned there that we'd be entering into that you think would surpass $200,000? I'm just thinking with the responsible contractor ordinance that we passed, this might be actually the, you know, the first case where we'd actually use it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's interesting. The, the screw pumps, we do not expect to be the uh, secondary clarifier project will be over 200,000. Um, you know, I th phase two is going to be, I think an amendment to our existing contract. Um, I, I think we can put in, I, honestly, I don't think there will be any issue with the, um, 
with the rates the con those contractors will be getting to meet the municipal ordinance. Um, I, you know, I haven't thought of, because we haven't even gotten to contract development yet. I haven't um, thought too much about how we'll in incorporate that, but I, that's certainly a discussion I have with ESG. Um, our department has actually just um, created some contract language related to the ordinance. I actually just got uh, an email from Corey Lynn, um, our project management director here in Public Works. He's developed that. Um, we'll have other projects this summer, um, likely that will exceed the 200,000 level. So we do anticipate uh, using that this year. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, I have one other. Um, oh, uh, um, I've got one other question uh, for you, which is um, the secondary blower that you said was a sort of an efficiency a project is that like what what is the sort of estimated ballpark cost of that is that on the like you know ten thousand dollar range hundred thousand dollar range you know where where does that roughly fall um, yeah I would, it's probably between one and two hundred thousand dollars so we have one high efficiency blower and then we have two very old um assist blowers so when there's a high demand for aeration, those uh, less efficient backup blowers have to kick on, um, and that's what we want to replace. Okay. Yeah, just as an efficiency project, I was just thinking about like what pots of money exist out there that might be available to help with efficiency-related projects. Even though I know we're already getting money from from Efficiency Vermont and and whatnot, but um, anyway, thank you. Other uh, other questions, comments. I don't know if you okay. can see me uh, and yes. I do have a question and and Kurt it's not directly related to what we're talking about but uh, we keep seeing news reports from other municipal waste systems of uh, of testing the uh, testing the uh, contents of the waste for uh, different strains of the coronavirus. I've been curious about whether we're doing that uh, here and if we have learned anything. Right, so uh, we're, we're not currently doing that. Um, the state did send out a couple of months ago um, an option for municipalities to sign up for um, that sort of testing where the state would actually cover the testing costs. And we applied for that. Um, haven't heard back of whether or not that is still moving forward. Um, I believe the only community currently doing that is uh, Burlington, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, it does take a, a lot of resources um, to manage something like that. And there's an expense for uh, an engineer to evaluate that data, the kind of expertise we don't really have in-house or the capacity to take on. but. Through the state program, they were willing to manage all that components and we would just essentially take the sample and send it out. Um, so if that comes through, we'll definitely move forward with it. Um, but it's uh, not something we could take on ourselves without some outside assistance. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have phase one questions? I can't see everybody either, so. <laughs> I think we're right. good, go ahead. Okay, so um, moving into the phase two project. So uh, as we mentioned, phase two is CHP, which is combined heat and power. Um, so that is essentially the, the export of electricity with heat recovery off of the engine and the exhaust of the generator that goes back into the heating loop, ties into the methane boiler loop um, in order to you know, maximize the efficiencies of, uh, of that energy and that heat being burned. Uh, this is the overall um, site plan schematic. So we'd be planning um, some new poles out along Dog River Road. Uh, there, that's where the transformer will be located is on the pole. Um, Chris and I, uh, Chris, our chief operator at the wastewater plant and myself really wanted to make sure we had the capacity to expand 
tanks uh, in the future if we need that, which I'm sure that someday the city will need expanded aeration tanks. So we've really been, um, you know, trying to uh, maximize the available future space at the plant. It's a fairly small footprint. Um, so the uh, power line will run uh, essentially right, a, well, 10 feet off of the public works, um, we call it the barn, that's our equipment storage building um, to allow for those future tank expansions. Uh, the other components of the project will include um, gas scrubbing equipment. So the methane has uh, contaminants, it has um, water that has to be removed in order to get to a quality uh, appropriate for use in a generator. Um, so we'll have the gas scrubbing, it, it comes out in a, um, like a, a, a media that is replaced, uh, and I think over, I think it's a four or five year period. Um, and then the generator will be a prepackaged unit, like self-enclosed with its own controls, um, which will be, uh, you know, sited in this corner. And this is the generator here. Uh, this is where the existing flare is. So we'll be tying into um, the line, the methane line that goes to the flare and bringing it into the generator uh, through the grass, gas scrubbing equipment and then into the generator. So that's sort of the footprint of the project. Um, just to overview of what we've done so far, um, back in March, City Council approved uh, a project development agreement with ESG. Um, as part of that agreement, there's a, a $250,000 or $250, financial commitment if the project um, is cash positive, uh, which right now it, it, it does, or it, it is right now. Um, <clears throat> in August, we executed the interconnection agreement with Green Mountain Power. So that is, that allowed them to essentially design all the electrical improvements that need to be done uh, in order to accept power to the grid um, and there's a lot to that. There's switch gears and fiber optic communications and, um, and all that <laughs> uh, electrical work that's required. Um, and that the cost of that is about 280,000 is the current estimate just for the electrical improvements. Uh, in December of last year, we were awarded the uh, standard offer set aside, which is through the Public Utility Commission so the export rate, the rate the city would be paid for power um, is 20.7 cents per kilowatt hour. We also got our air permit in December um, because of the project um, puts us over a threshold where we'd now be regulated under an air permit. The facility never had one previously. And then the, the biggest um, hurdle to permitting is a certificate of public good, which really includes a lot of other permits. So um, sort of a, a full package of um, compliance documents that goes into that. And we had an attorney assist with that. So, so far we've spent about $25,000 just in permit fees. Um, <clears throat> and then the cost. So uh, last time we presented the council, ESG had a, a project cost estimate of $5 million, which we had planned to fund through um, the available money from the grant proceeds. So we didn't, well, we'd use the bond money that we didn't have to use because we got um, the grants from USDA and the state. Uh, now we're looking at a cost of 6 million and uh, we're working with, um, uh, working with ESG to try to negotiate that cost down um, to see if we can avoid a, a bond vote, but there is a potential that we will need um, a bond vote in order to do the phase two project. Uh, based on the last meeting with ESG, they still anticipate a cash positive project, even at a, a $6 million construction cost, which means um, the revenue generated from the project would offset all of the debt service and operating costs and still um, have some extra, some profit margin. And then next steps for phase two, um, like I mentioned, we're negotiating with ESG to try to reduce the contract cost, the project cost. Um, uh, DPW finance and the planning department met to discuss um, what grant opportunities there might be out there for this work. Um, uh, 
finance and DPW are discussing uh, other ways that we could fund the, um, the gap without going to bond. And then um, for the contract side of it, we, we need to um, develop a, a, a new guarantee structure. Um, so I, what we're talking about is merging the guarantee between our current phase one contract and uh, the CHP project because they're so related in the way um, tipping free revenues are, are structured. So there's the tip, the, the waste that um, is, is best for producing methane and meets the food waste requirements is not always the most profitable from um, just a processing standpoint. So uh, there's gonna be some work involved with um, building that into the contract, developing that guarantee and, and, and coming to a point where it meets the phase one intent and adds on um, what we need for phase two. Uh, MEAC's always been a, a partner on this upgrade and we are um, in discussions with them when trying to set up a, a date for a workshop with them to go through everything. Um, I'm not seeing a, a draft contract yet. So once we get that, um, um, DPW will review it and then we'll go to uh, legal review. And the goal is to come back to council with a contract um, in April. Uh, I think that's um, an aggressive timeline, but um, that's what we're shooting for. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And then if that does stay on track, um, if we do meet that, um, approval date, then we could be starting construction as early as May of this year. That is phase two update. Questions on that? Yeah, so <clears throat> I appreciate the pushing for April for a, a contract. Uh, one of the things that I I'm sure everybody also noted this, uh, but just thinking about the potential for another bond vote. Um, if if we do end up needing another bond vote for phase two, <clears throat> excuse me, um, would that also become clear by April? Yeah, yeah. I'll explain more before that. Um, okay, and so if there is another bond vote that's needed, that we don't otherwise have you know, the sound is very interesting um the there's not otherwise another there's no planned november uh vote for like otherwise so would that hold up the project potentially or would you anticipate um needing to do some kind of special election maybe maybe that's this is too early to tell um, but yeah, yeah, it just seems like we do need, yeah, if we do need a bond vote, it would, it would like likely in order to meet the timelines required. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Um, yes, yeah, so we've talked about we it would require a special election. Um, you know, if we the next regularly scheduled election is next March. Um, and so it would be a year away. So whatever cost escalation, not only would we have another year's worth, but, uh, you know, they're not right now they're on site. Um, so the idea would be to continue the work. Um, so we would want to do that as quickly as possible. Maybe, you know, take a little bit of risk on some of the design costs, you know, to keep it moving, um, in the event that the bond didn't pass. Uh, but so that if it did pass, we could keep going. We'd have to we'd have to talk that all through. We're also looking at options, as Kurt mentioned, to uh, proceed without a bond. But um, I asked him to at least mention that possibility to you all tonight to get a reaction, or at least you know get people thinking about it. Well, that's that's good to know, and uh, just to be mentally prepared. I mean, obviously, we had have had conversations about other bonds and, and potentially putting off other bonds because of just like the financial climate um, right now. But um, this with it, you know, as a matter of urgency, it seems like it could be the kind of thing that would be at least, you know, at least worth talking about and putting before folks. If, and if that's be, what it comes to. 
and it would be you know a million dollars or less um, and it would be presumably paid for by rev you know the revenues anticipated revenues of the project now I, I think that's also a driving factor in our negotiations is at what point are our energy savings and energy you know is it not worth it to do it right now it's still cash positive at the, the prices so yeah uh, so you know hopefully we'd be able to go to the voters and say hey, look we need authorization to borrow this extra money it's not ten another ten million or anything. It's less than a million, and it's going to pay for itself. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That that is all um, really helpful uh, information. Other questions, comments. Go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in if you have a something you want to ask about. I go ahead. Ben. So. What is the timeline exactly on the CPG? When do we think that's going to be issued? It's in the, I think they went in um, probably early a month or so. What we're yeah. looking at. It's, it's, it's under, under uh, I think the, the due date for moments is um, it's coming, coming up in the next, next week or so. I'd have to double check to give you specific dates. Um, like, well, like I said, I said we submitted it in January. January. Um, I think I there's a deadline you know, in the next couple of weeks for comments, and then there's a 30 day response period. So I think, I think within a month or two, we should have had that. So I, I think I understood you, but it's like you've got a Darth Vader filter on your voice right now. <laughs> I definitely didn't understand him. Okay. He's, he's channeling his inner Tom Waits. Thank the answer is it's uh, there's one deadline in a month or uh, in, in like next week and then um, another in a month or two. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say, say um, we expect to have, have it within a month or two. Month or two. Month or two. There you go. Any other questions? All right, go ahead. Oops. I lost money. Hey, um, <clears throat> this is really just a light overview. We don't have um, a lot, a lot of information. For it, but um, Kurt, you might yes. want to try like turning your mic on and off or something because it's really getting almost unintelligible. Okay, I didn't mean not so yeah, just your mic or something. I don't know, it's something's happened, it was fine earlier. Is filled up with water. <laughs> yeah. Am I about to turn off the video? Is it any better? No, it's still about the same. Maybe you could try the call in option. I can mute um, that's that's thing on my phone. phone. Um, yeah, that could work. Um, one thought actually is that we could potentially take just like a five minute break. Uh, right now and uh, give you a chance to to connect in a different way or you know try to resolve it and then we'll be back here in like five minutes does that sound okay yes yes that sounds great okay um all right it's 8 28 we're gonna take a five minute break so see you back very soon okay um so just want to start off by saying um you know our, our core function at wastewater treatment is water quality. Um, 
you know, we are very focused on that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a great team of operators. We, we have very rarely ever exceed any, um, any of our permit limits. And if we do, they're very small um, things like a very um, slight amount of pH um, being off from what we're expected. So, and we're well under our phosphorus discharge limits. We, we always, we have been since, um, since I've been working with the plant. Um, so they do a great job at the, uh, down there and uh, we, we do take uh, this very seriously. Um, so just uh, providing some um, status of where we're at and, and I recall, uh, if council recalls we had uh, the state come in um, it's probably about a year ago uh, to really talk through the, the PFAS issue. It's, just, it's an emerging contaminant. Um, we're all learning about it. Um, and there's a there's quite a bit going on with regard to regulating it um, and really trying to figure out the best way to, uh, to deal with this issue. Uh, so I have had some recent discussions with um, the Department of Environmental Conservation and they're projecting that a surface water discharge limit will be issued in 2024. So right now that it's regulated for drinking water, but it's not regulated for wastewater plants in Vermont. Um, but it will be yeah, and it's coming. Um, our levels right now are um, around 70 parts per trillion, which is the EPA drinking water standard. So um, our levels, uh, you know, um, well, I'll just say that's that's roughly where we're at now. We don't know what they'll set. Uh, surface water discharge limits at, but uh, I would expect it would be um, somewhat higher than the drinking water standard. Um, EPA has recently issued uh, interim guidance on PFAS destruction that was issued in December. I have not had a chance to go through it, but um, certainly can connect council with that. I think that is going to partially guide uh, the state of Vermont and how we um, uh, deal with this issue. Um, <clears throat> Coventry, uh, under there, um, they have actually two permits. Uh, they have a solid waste certificate and a pretreatment permit. Uh, under their solid waste uh, certificate, they are required to test for PFAS um, uh, twice a year in May and April. Uh, actually, it's not May and April, it should be May and October. And they're um, sharing that data with us. So we have uh, some sense that there's any change in trending um, with regards to PFAS levels in the leachate they're accepting. And that report, um, well, uh, they had under their permit, they were required to do a study to look at treatment options for PFAS at the landfill. And um, the website link I, I put there has uh, a wealth of documents um, this particular report, I think, is 180 pages. And actually, the state of Vermont hired their own engineer um, to evaluate uh, the report that um, Casella needed to prepare under their permit. Um, so there's just a, a lot of a lot of work um, taking place right now as far as regulating landfills. Um, uh, when my discussions with the state, there there may be some sort of uh, treatment requirement added to their permit when it's uh, when it's renewed. Um, I just wanted to note that as part of our current project, we are not increasing any leachate receiving. Uh, that is staying the same. Uh, none of the work um, was related to increasing our ability to treat leachate. Um, I talked to uh, our consultant, ESG, about uh, what they expected PFAS levels um, to be in the high strength organic waste. Um, and they're very confident that the levels of PFAS um, and this material will be lower than what's coming, you know, in the influent from the from the city of uh, the residents. Um, and in, in, in discussion with the state, there right now uh, in in our region, um, there isn't an alternative disposal for leachate. So if um, you know if it doesn't come to Montpelier, the leachate is going to go to Barry or Essex. Or even, um, you know, to New Hampshire, but it, but it will go to a plant very similar to Montpelier's plant and be, um, you know, dealt treated in the same general manner. None of these plants uh, that are available to Casella to discharge leachate have the ability right now to treat uh, for PFAS. 
Um, and then finally, just, um, you know, we, the city is very open to working with the DEC. We've done, we've participated in past studies when they um, sampled not only the influent and effluent, but also uh, our solids that go back to the landfill. Um, and also, you know, Casella is a partner with the city because they do take uh, all the solids after they're dewatered from the plant. Um, we have a, a good working relationship with them. You know, they're very forthcoming with any information they have available related to this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, regular you know, discussions with them about this and, and other items related to solid disposal. Uh, as part of the project, we may even be able to use, you know, get a reduced rate because our sludge is going to be so dry that they could use it for um, top cover at the landfill. So it's just one example of some of the things we discussed with them. So that's really all I've got. Um, happy to open this up to discussion. Great. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from council? And Kurt, if you wouldn't mind, um, stopping sharing your screen then we can um, see if folks have questions thank you uh, so I, I, oh yeah go ahead lauren yeah um thanks kurt this is really helpful i think we had dug in right before the pandemic struck and then good have, haven't had a chance and i'm glad to be looking at this again um appreciate the update um so just a couple questions um so I just, you know, there's still the situation where we know we're taking in this chemical that we know is then passing through. It's extremely persistent, it's mobile. So, you know, the, as long as we continue to do this, you know, we're just creating this problem that we know exists. I mean, this PFAS, I know it was like referred to as a emerging contaminant, but I think at this point it's, I mean, it's a hazardous waste in Vermont. Like we, this is kind of a, a well-known contaminant by many standards at this point. Um, so I'm just like trying to figure out, I mean, I totally get that there aren't good options at this moment, but it seems like, you know, either is there more that we could be doing for requiring monitoring of our effluent or the water or the soil other things it seems like if casella you know we're we're taking this kind of known risk bringing it in and you know even if their alternative is we're just going to put it somewhere else but you know could we be working with them as part of our partnership that they're going to you know at least get us better data it was a really limited data set right that did the 70 part per trillion um it was a few like seven samples or something um, I just, yeah. I feel like getting a better handle on like what's happening. And then if I would, I would love the city of Montpelier um, as one of the, you know, off takers of this to be pushing on um, A&R to be really looking hard at the pretreatment requirements. Like I think they should be doing on-site pretreatment of this leachate. It should not be getting sent to all over the state or to other sites. Like I think they should be keeping it on site at the landfill. Um, so I, I just like whatever options, I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, how, you know, it sounds like you're in lots of these good conversations with them. And like, if there's ways that council could be helpful. Um, I just think like, this doesn't seem like a good long-term plan. Like they need to be dealing with this. Um, I know uh, Casella and I will both be testifying tomorrow morning on a bill to ban PFAS from a bunch of products that will, but like, we're gonna be dealing with this for a long time. Um, so yeah, just curious, any, any reactions or thoughts on like what we could be doing to get better data and or be pushing the state on the pretreatment piece? Um, well, let's start with the, the data. So, I mean, there's one, the challenge to more data is it's a, you know, it's a fairly expensive test. Um, I think if the city wants more data, likely we would have to pay for that, whether whether we ask Casella to pay for it up front and they raise their disposal rates, um, or whether um, you know we just pay for it directly, I think, which is fine. I you know um, if that's something council is interested in, we certainly can do that. Um, 
the as far as the um, indirect discharge, uh, you know, I think it. I think likely that is the direction um, that this is going to go. The study we talked about, or that I mentioned here uh, for design um, alternatives, uh, there were they looked at both treatment on site um, at the landfill and treatment at uh, wastewater plants. Um, the problem at wastewater plants is, um, you know, we have a limited capacity as like any plant. Uh, to take only a certain amount of leachate. So they would have to install multiple uh, locations of treatment at, you know, several plants. So um, I think that's very an unlikely approach. So I think yeah, I think that the way the state is already moving is on-site treatment. Um, <clears throat> the the other issue with treatment though is um, is you end up with a byproduct. So there's, you know, there's carbon filtration, but then you end up with this concentrated you know, block of PFAS and you have to do something with that. You can try to incinerate it, but then you don't know what sort of uh, emissions are going to be created by burning this. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of, and, and the EPA document I mentioned that has some recommendations, but it's very preliminary um, and it just came out just a couple months ago. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert on this topic, but um, it is something, you know, where that we're really watching closely and, um, you know, and, and like I said, on the testing, if, if council um, is interested in, in additional data, uh, we certainly can line that up um, and get it in place. It's just, you know, there'll be some budgetary impact, which is just totally fine. So I guess those, those are my thoughts on, on those questions or comments. Madam Mayor, I have, when I get it, when you get a chance, yeah, I'm going to make a comment and then you can go there, Stephen. I, so uh, I am interested in potential solutions for PFAS as the science emerges, you know, in terms of um, if, if incineration occurs, what are the byproducts and are there ways to uh, capture any harmful harmful parts of that? Um, I, you know, knowing that it's persistent is certainly, uh, I mean, obviously it means it's limited as to what we can do uh, with it, but I, yeah, I'm interested in if as much as we can being a part of the solution and knowing that we are still sort of waiting for, in a sense, potentially waiting on science for this, because my assumption is that the PFAS is not going to be, break down in the methane digestion process, right? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, no, I, I don't know how much that um, that there's really a lot of PFAS in the methane. Um, it's primarily in you know the liquid and solid streams, uh, but I don't, you know, I, I haven't honestly dug into that question is, is, is it present in the methane? I couldn't say for sure. Um, and does it come out in the, in the media scrubbing, the gas scrubbing equipment? No, I don't know that either. Um, I just, uh, it's fair. I mean, I know it's been around for a few years, but in, in terms of treatment and, um, and science, it's, it's still a relatively new issue. Um, and we're still learning about it. And so is, and so is the state and so is the EPA. So, um, I don't have all the answers. Yeah, no, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, just on that disposal point, and um, so like I was on a call with some national scientists recently who were talking about like at this point their advice is basically hold on to it for a few years. There just really are no good like incinerating it. You're it's usually creating some environmental justice issue. It's going to some low income, often a community of color that have these incinerators and it doesn't get destroyed. It just gets then like put into the air. So they're not recommending um, that, or at least the scientists who are presenting on this call, they, they're looking at things like, um, like the way they destroy like chemical weapons and stuff. Like there's some interesting technologies, but like they're not ready yet for like widespread or they're cost prohibitive. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge mess that everyone nationally is dealing with. And, you know, I, I know our, our, uh, 
our team at DPW is like trying their best and working hard. And it's just tough. Cause like, you know, there's this, you know, contaminant and there are not good solutions. So just like racking our brains of how we're staying as on top of it. So, you know, appreciate yeah. the So the idea but, is that, yeah. you know, to the, or the advice is to hang on to it so that we hope that that will, will develop a process in coming years. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So for things like the concentrated, um, I mean, like there's ways I think they could like treat leachate that they know how to do right now, but then you get this, the, as Kurt was describing, like the, then it goes in like a carbon filter that's then like saturated with the stuff. And what do you do with that? Then does it just go back in the landfill and keep the contamination cycle? So it's, right. it's just a mess. Thank you. Um, Steven, go ahead. And then Donna. Yeah, I want to just uh, raise or piggyback on the alarm here. Uh, I'm troubled that uh, our city employee only referenced the federal standard at 70, and as if that's okay. Vermont's standard is 20 parts per trillion, and so we're three and a half times that uh, for drinking water. And people do swim in the river where this effluent ends up, and so Barry you know, sh sharing the load across the berry uh, plant water treatment doesn't solve the problem of it being our river. It's getting concentrated in fish that people are eating out of Lake Champlain. And I know people who have lost internal organs, you know, and who, you know, it, it, this is really insidious, toxic, super toxic stuff. I mean, when you talk about getting rid of the um, it's disrupting hormone cycles and, uh, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's not something to be tolerant of and patient with. It's something to like get, get eliminate out of our, every, at every opportunity, eliminate out of our, uh, ingestion streams. So, it, you know, there's an economy of bringing leachate down here and it's got to go somewhere, but we don't have to be tolerant of continuing to propagate it into people's, you know, or internal organs and uh and medical bills so uh there is an engineer that i know who who worked on on the issues uh who can answer the questions about whether or not it gets into the methane and back into the air he was working on the plants uh down in uh bennington county um and he's he, he's a person i mentioned who had to have some uh, internal parts removed and now he feels a lot better, but he's he's working with the world leaders on this issue, uh, the scientists. So I'll put you in touch with him if you want. But I guess my point is, it, there's got to be there may be extra room in some of these casks down at Yankee uh, for this this kind of block uh, charcoal filters to go. You know, uh, we need to think really outside the box to keep this stuff in the box. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. It's it's. But yeah, it's 20 parts per trillion is Vermont standard. And uh, so let's not be complacent with the 70 part federal. It, it, nothing coming out of Washington in recent years is to be trusted. All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Donna. I, I was wondering what's the range of cost if we actually start doing some testing of like and be able to measure after certain steps within our processes what is there and how we can isolate it ourselves. Is there a way to isolate it ourselves? Even if we're stuck with, let's say, filters, but if we know it's there and we know basic concentration of it, at least we're starting to deal with the problem and remove it and put it in one place maybe. Is that possible? Um, <clears throat> certainly the testing is definitely doable. Uh, I don't know the exact number and it would depend on, you know, which streams we're testing. Are we testing it coming in through the pipes, um, leaving the plant, uh, the solids stream, um, and then at what, what frequency, but, you know, I think the test, I believe, and I'm not hundred percent sure is somewhere between somewhere near a thousand dollars. The treatment is, uh, is very expensive. Um, the, the, Casella report has some preliminary estimates in it. I think it ranged from 10 to $20 million um, for an on-site system. 
I don't know exactly what that would be at the plant, um, what a carbon filtration system, but it would be in the millions. Um, oh, wow. Because you have to take it the whole liquid stream, and that would just deal with the liquid stream, you know, the effluent that goes to the river. Um, you know, we still have PFAS in the solids that would go back to landfill, but would not deal with treating that, and I'm not sure how, if there is a good way to do that right now. It just seems that if it's coming into our plants that we want to try to measure the sources of it to see which sources has the most and then to really follow through how much is coming out of our system. Yeah, we have baseline data from the, from the state study. Um, we don't have, like Lauren mentioned, it's not a, it's not a ton of samples, um, but they did sample all those and, and all in a very, um, at various plants throughout the state. They sample all of the locations. So we have kind of a baseline of where we're at, um, but we don't have a lot of data. So if that's something the council is interested in, we can, you know, put some numbers together and, um, you know, come back with a proposal. Community run testing. Um, Mayor, can I add uh, one more sentence um, here? Hold on. Yeah, hold on a second. Sure. Um, go ahead, Lauren. Just one one thing that might be worth exploring, um, I don't know if there'd be anything to it, but I know some communities have started um, suing to recoup the costs, essentially going up to the chemical manufacturers as the ultimate liable party, since they knew these chemicals were toxic for decades, lied about it. Um, and so there's been some success at holding chemical companies responsible for these costs. Like it really shouldn't be on us and it's not, Casella's fault either that these chemicals are put into products and the companies who use it were misled on the safety of these chemicals. Um, so it might be worth a conversation with the AG. I know they're already in lawsuits for costs to the state from PFAS contamination going after the chemical manufacturers. So we could see what the status of that is and if these kinds of costs could be recouped as part of it. Um, just an idea. But <laughs> That seems pretty interesting to me, just as a, a way, again, if we're going to end up dealing with this, if we're able to somehow break it down, like that's, it, I, maybe that's not realistic, but I, my, I keep hoping that like we'll be able to, and if not, that we'll be able to, you know, end up with a block of, of PFAS, let's say, so that it can be <clears throat> isolated. But if that process is in the millions of dollar range finding <laughs> finding someone else to pay for it would be obviously a deal um but uh yeah go, go ahead donna and then we'll go back to Steve. thank you along those lines what if we add one add that to our legislative efforts because this is a statewide problem everyone's having it and as a group then going after the chemical manufacturers we you know must more muscle behind it well that's interesting yeah yeah. Go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, Stephen. We'll, we'll go to Dan and then we'll go to Stephen. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't be uh, super excited about jumping on a lawsuit on our own with a large chemical manufacturer. That's um, <laughs> that seems like a huge um, risk and investment. Um, but if there is ongoing litigation, um, that the AG spearheading, it does make a lot of sense for us to talk with them to see the scope of their litigation um, because they may or may not have conceived of these damages um, as potential um, damages in which they would fashion for any type of settlement or remedy. Um, so I think it does make it does make a certain amount of sense just to make sure that the AG has this on their radar. Um, you know, it, it also strikes me that this is a largely um, a, a problem that we can monitor, but um, some, of this, some of this talk about isolating it, um, I don't know how realistic that is. Kurt, do you have a sense, um, you know, to what extent, um, how much material are we talking about with, with this PFAS contamination? Um, would it would it be if if we had to collect it? Would it quickly form a, a huge like mound uh, of this material, or is it 
relatively modest when it's collective. I'm not familiar enough with the treatment process to really give you a, you know, a volume estimate on that. Just to, I don't know that much about um, PFAS treatment um, and what's generated from, as a result of it. But I mean, the, the material that, that's carrying it right now, I mean, we, we treat the material and some of this goes into the water system and some of it remains after the, the treatment, right? Is that? Well, our plant was never built to treat PFAS um, and it doesn't. So, you know, we treat essentially everything else that's in leachate, the, bio, the biological oxygen demand and the metals and um, everything else. Um, but uh, PFAS it basically just goes you know, right through more or less. There's not, um, there's no mechanism to take it out of the, the liquid stream at the plant. And, and really, like I mentioned, uh, there aren't any plants that have that in place right now in the region. Um, so whether it comes to Montpelier or Mary or Essex um, or anywhere else in the region, uh, it's going to be handled the same way essentially as the uh, multi-layers plant. Right. So I mean, at the, at the very least, if we are talking about going to the AG for a remedy, some type of solution that would remove it, you know, that would be not a cost burden to us or any community affected by it. it seems like one of the goals that we should be looking for to achieve. And I don't know if that's a cost goal or a technology goal that, or I mean, uh, sorry, if the hurdles are cost hurdles or technology hurdles um, to that. But at, at the very least, that seems like a very tangible harm that we're encountering uh, as a result of this, um, let alone any type of impact that's happening because this uh, material is passing through because we have no way to treat it. Yeah, and it's the same for, um, you know, PFAS isn't just in leachate, it's in you know, all household waste, it's, so it's coming. You know, it comes down the pipes. Um, so yeah. if if we really wanted to take all the PFAS out of um, what is discharged, you know, you would have to put, you would have to invest heavily in a treatment system at the plant. It can't just be free treatment at the landfill. Yeah. Thanks. Madam, is yes. my turn? Yes, yes, I'm sorry, Stephen, go right ahead. Yeah, the, uh, I, I'm concerned. I know that there was litigation and there was some settlement uh, between the Scott administration and uh, DuPont or, or the company that bought the, the Southern Vermont plants uh, in exchange for some waterline extensions. So we, we need to be right on top of this and see, make sure we're part of a class or party that is not already entered into a settlement, which the AG may have. But the governor, I believe, also vetoed a medical monitoring bill that was designed around measuring the PFAS levels in, in people's bloodstreams. So um, people who know they've been affected by it, they know they're carrying it with them. Uh, there are people who've gone as far as having their blood drawn and filtered uh, in order to try to get this stuff out. Um, and flushed almost, but it's it's monitoring the effluent that we're taking in from the landfill, the leachate, is not unlike a med medical monitoring, and that's the easiest uh, and the smallest amounts of money to, to get without, you know, waiving future remedies. Uh, that's we should easily be able to get those amounts of money from the. Uh, the generators of this stuff, primarily DuPont and 3M. So I I, I know that we can align. Uh, Dan, I'll give you the name of the lawyer who's been lead on this down on the Ohio plant and, and reach, you know, very large hundreds of millions of dollar settlements, um, which were still not adequate. But uh, I think if, if, if you're willing to devote the time to get caught up to speed, uh, I'll put you in touch with these folks because I worked on this a few years ago. And uh, But monitoring we should be doing, we should not take anybody's word or take for granted that one load versus the next might be off by huge amounts uh, based on what 
concentration of what settled into the leachate in a particular month. So I don't think we should take for granted that we're only seeing the concentrations that have been randomly measured here and there. So yes, find maybe use some of this federal money to do the interim intensive testing uh, at a thousand dollars a pop, and and let's get a, a a good baseline that we can make some informed decisions and decide how how much of a priority to do this. And uh, Dan, I'll talk to you offline about who to talk to to get your uh, baseline. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments? Um, just to uh, come back to this question about like whether or not we want to be collecting more data, um, are, are others interested in that, in having numbers? I'm seeing some nods. I know Lauren, you're interested. I. Um, yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Well, just, I mean, one one thought, obviously, so the state had done that first baseline study and in it, you know, so they did find PFAS at every single wastewater treatment facility, but it was like five parts per trillion and the ones that took leachate were like 70, as Kurt said. So it, it was significantly more like you tied to the leachate, but still it's concerning that it's everywhere. But I mean, it seems like the state should, I think our first ask should be of DEC of like, they need to do an updated study and even like the places where it was found at the higher levels, which was a much smaller number, doing a deeper dive at what's happening at those. So, and I'm happy to try to push on that, see if we could get any traction. Um, I, you know, Mary had mentioned that some of this money that's coming in is for water and sewer. I don't know if there's any flexibility with this, um, you know, so things that seem really expensive, like a thousand dollar test, but if, if the state's paying for it, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, but I, I, I think DEC should do a follow-up study. Like this is a statewide problem that they need to be also owning and getting better data. So like, I want, I mean, I would love us to, you know, make sure we're doing what needs to happen. Um, and would love to see if the state's interested in the next phase as well. Yeah. Uh, Donna. Well, I mean, the solid waste district deals with this. I mean, the whole landfill uh, they, is a big concern for them. So that's somebody who we should contact for their expertise and situation. Um, and so there's, I, I heard talk about putting a filter, which maybe they already do at landfills, but they aren't strong enough. But again, they would collect them and then what do you do with it? Um, but I think we should partner with a lot of regional places that solid waste solid waste district and the regional planning commission all are talking about it the clean water basin plan that comes through the regional planning commission is talking about it so i think there are plenty of partners there to put pressure on the state uh connor go ahead yeah no i think like all this stuff anything worth doing is worth doing right and you know we could write a stern letter to the state or something but i just assume bring them in you know i, th I thought that was a decent conversation we had with DEC last time they came in. So I actually have a back and forth with them, you know. Um, otherwise, we're just talking to ourselves. So I, I, I'd like to see that in the future. Hmm. Getting a thumbs up from Jack. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling lots of different threads here um yeah go ahead dan well maybe i'll, I'll i was just feeling the same way uh, it almost seems like the probably the first first two directions to go in would be to reach out to dec um on two fronts which would be to see if they're willing to update the testing or if they have that on their agenda and then at the same time ask them to come back that you know this is this has been it's been a year we, we sort of like an update about the PFAS situation um in that conversation and then I think the other prong would be to have a conversation with the AG's office um about any current litigation involving PFAS um and maybe those are the first two steps to work on and then 
take this issue up, you know, next month with, with whatever y this yields. Yeah, that makes sense to me to check in with those agencies and then come back to it with what their answers are, uh, what their, their update is so that we can have a little more information to, to inform which, what next steps we might want to pursue. Um, does that sound, I don't know that we need a motion for that, but was, is that relatively, or how, how are people feeling about those two steps? Checking in with DC, checking in with the AG. Okay, getting getting some thumbs up there. Um, so that that makes sense to me, and then we can uh, come back to it later on. Is this um, is that sounding doable to you, Kurt or um, Bill or whoever would be taking it on? I don't think we'd be asking Kurt to to get involved in the in the. Uh advocacy end of things he can give us technical yeah. advice but we certainly work with him on, on this yes but for, someone for from, projects to get finished fair enough fair enough <laughs> yeah uh but someone on staff would, would follow up on that go but yes we'll just figure out who okay great okay um great thank you um and or any anything else on this topic before we move on? Okay. Gosh, thank you so much, Kurt. I um, am a huge fan of uh, our wastewater uh, or water resource recovery facility, just in general. And I think all the processes are actually quite fascinating. And so this this whole thing has been really helpful. And uh, I know we've. Got a lot of questions and concerns about PFAS, but um, you know I appreciate you taking the time to give us this update, and um, you know we'll we'll just see what makes sense for us moving forward. So, thank you again. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here, sticking around. <laughs> um, you know, as COVID winds down, hopefully soon, and the plants um, projects wrap up, um, council should really come down and see it. It's it's uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, I'm really excited to take the tour of the new, uh, of the upgrades. That's going to be very exciting. <laughs> uh, Jack, do you have something more? Except for, I think you're muted. That was exactly what I was going to say. Hey, that's my computer. I'm hanging up. All right, it's working. Um, That's great. I was going to say, yeah, I'm eager to see, to get the tour. Yeah. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. All right. Thank you again, Kurt. And uh, yep. we are going to uh, move on then to uh, the temporary parklet ordinance. This is our second uh, reading of this. I'm going to open the public hearing on uh this remember to do that and uh so um uh, i think that what was attached was uh similar to what was attached the previous time or is it i is it different <laughs> i don't think it was different but bill i'll let you i don't know i didn't think that we had made any real major differences last time so okay. I, maybe i missed that in my notes so we would, what, what we were going to do, we did talk, we have a better sense of, uh, and Donna, I think is on, hopefully, uh, Donna and Connor uh, talked to a lot of people about what they might be doing. So we have some sense of what is happening. We, in theory, we could amend the ordinance a little bit to allow the, right now there's very, it's restricted to Main Street, Langdon and State Street. Um, there is uh, a common market is interested in using that corner near Elm and, and so, you know, possibly we could open that up as a possible zone that would require an amendment. Um, we didn't hear from anyone else, but I'd actually want, I, I think you'd be more interesting for me to hear from council member Casey or from the public works director about their findings. Otherwise, I think we're ready to, you know, to go ahead. I did one, I think they'll tell you this, but the only message we really, that I took away from the report I got from them was, you know, as soon as we can, we're ready to go. 
Yeah, sure. And piggy, piggybacking off of that, you know, we, we asked people like, uh, uh, when would you like to set up your parklet? And they were like, if you give us a shovel, we'll like set it up at the end of the day. You know, <laughs> people are eager to get going. Um, you know, Don and I made the rounds. I, I could, actually couldn't believe how many uh, business owners we got in touch with. Uh, just doing a bit of canvassing on Thursday afternoon there. Um, and, and I think, you, you know, if you talk to some of the owners, they were really saying like a couple of cases, 80% of our business last summer was due to those parklets. Um, so I doubt you'll see anybody who had one last time not take one. Uh, but in addition to that, you see a whole lot of new interest um, with the new uh, Indian Nepali restaurant that set up there, maybe, maybe doing something on Langdon Street. Uh, Uncommon Market had some really creative ideas. Oaks and Evelyn, the new business coming in. Uh, they were very excited about doing that and maybe sharing some uh, space with Julio's. Uh, so there was a real good energy in the air as we were making the rounds there. Uh, people were so excited about it. Um, you know, I know one issue that came up last um, meeting was Langdon Street Tavern and eliminating the parking spaces on the other side of the street from the parklet. Um, they were very clear. They would love to have those parking spaces, um, even if it was a little tight. Um, so I, I, I think deep, and Donna can totally weigh in here. I think DPW was going to see if that was a possibility as well, uh, but, th but that would work fine. So overall, people are ready to get going. Um, I didn't see any problems with the card language that needed to be changed. Um, and I, I, I think we'll have a pretty vibrant outdoor scene um, April 15th or whenever the date is that we, we start letting this go. So, uh, Don, I don't know if you wanted to piggyback off that a bit. I, I can just add that um, I have gone back to a couple of the vendors that we talked with um, and let them know that um, there is an option um, just to request um, in the current ordinance um, if they're not on one of the three streets that's clearly identified. So they can just make a request of the city manager. I'm assuming it doesn't quite say that, but I would think that would be appropriate. Um, to open the parklet for them and they would have to describe what that would entail. We'd have to go look at it. And, um, you know, that's what we've done with the others. Um, last year, we just helped those um, businesses to make the best choice that would be two parking spots. Um, that's already defined in the ordinance. So I don't think that it really needs to change um, the language in the ordinance in order to do that, as long as um, Bill is willing to have his office be the, the point well, we, on those conversations. Well, we have been in the past, so I don't mind that. I guess as long as we're clear on our intent. So section B says that the city manager is authorized to issue permits for parklets and public spaces on, you know, Main State Langdon. And then the manager is always authorized to reserve spaces if needed for public safety, blah, blah, blah. Then it says, says parklets outside of the designated area will be considered on a case by case basis, but didn't say by who. So the question is, you know, does that mean if there's a parklet that's outside of what the manager can authorize, it's got to come back to the city council for approval after there's a design? So I think that's just the one area that needs clarity that would allow. Okay, uh, Dan and then Jack, and then sure. Don. Uh, along those lines, uh, I'm wondering if, given the interest in Uncommon Market, and did anybody reach out to the Hippie Chickpea on on Elm Street or the Royal Orchid? Um, Sorry, they're they're closed this week, Dan, um, but they're on the list to hit up this weekend or Monday when they open back up. Um, it, yeah. I, I imagine that would be a great spot for them on Elm Street if they could do it. So, I mean, I, I, I would certainly be comfortable expanding the Parklet District to include Elm Street um, between uh, State and Main, I mean, sorry, sorry State and School, um, as well as School Street, um, you know, on that corner there. Um, although, well, maybe not School Street, um, but it, that might be a case by case kind of basis pain. kind of thing. But but I'm thinking at least Elm Street. What? Yeah. School Street's pretty tight. It, it is. I mean, I'm thinking just outside of the uh, right. uncommon market. There, there is that spot that's kind of quasi parking. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's not really uh, a parking space, but everyone treats it as such. Um, but, you know, I'm wondering, well, I mean, at least so I'd be comfortable expanding this to Elm Street between school and um, uh, state, um, or even if we wanted to include it all the way up to um, Birch Grove, but that's probably too far. I'm, I'm speculating, but I would feel comfortable with Elm between school and school and the state. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if there shouldn't be some sort of flexibility either for start dates or end dates that we had talked about before, um, you know, given the response that you've received from people and thinking about like what the weather tomorrow is going to be like and how, you know, there might be people what, what, once we get into that April where April can be a snowy April or it can be a warm April. Um, if there is any sort of sense and, and, and I asked this question also thinking from a public works perspective, if there's things you need to do on the street before we, we sort of un, unfurl um, these parklets for the summer, um, if it does make sense for that May 1st date, um, but to give any type of discretion in this ordinance. Um, and I'll stop there, although I have another point. I think around timing, I think timing for the individuals who want to cite a parklet is going to vary slightly. Um, I don't think any of the people we spoke to wanted to start in advance of the first date that's in the current ordinance. Um, and so, um, you know, we could just help them roll out um, as they need to or want to or have the availability to. I don't think many of them would vary by more than a few weeks from the start date. Um, and I think they'd adjust their timelines um, into the evening. We saw that last year. So as weather got warmer and better, um, they'd probably have slightly longer time frame. Um, and and um, might not be the same to begin with. Um, I think we could adapt to that. Um, Connor, I'm, I didn't have this conversation with you when we were walking around. So if you want to weigh in. No, that, that, that sounds right though. Thanks. Yeah, I think that, you know, the issues, so a couple of things. One, um, the winter parking re uh, regulations end April 1st, I believe. So that is one possible date. I think, you know, we'd always viewed that sort of April, again, it's unpredictable in terms of temperature and snow. Uh, and it's also the chance to sort of do some clean spring sweeping and, you know, it's tougher to sweep if there's parklets in places. I mean, we can still do it. It's just, it's not as thorough. But I mean, if you wanted to move it up to April 15, right now it's still listed as May 1st. Um, so, I mean, you could, you know, that's your prerogative, really. I think it's just going to be there may be inconvenience to other things. And obviously if we have a snowstorm and we've got to be plowing to curbs and those things are in the way, then that's, you know, that's the main risk. Yeah. Um, oh, hey, sure. we have an expert. Um, let's go. Uh, well, so Jack, I think you were, you were in line and then let's go Jay and then Wes. All right. Thank you. Um, I like this. I think this is great. Um, Connor and Donna, when you were talking to uh, Uncommon Market, were they figuring that they would be doing it on Elm Street or were they unclear? I, I, I tell you what they would like to do, Jack, is they've got, they've got a nice deck area that a lot of people don't know they have outside Uncommon Market. So if they were able to put it on, you know, School Street, it would kind of create an L there. Um, that they could have the service coming in and out, you know. I, I think it's a little more awkward doing it on Elm Street. Um, there was something with the, and Donna can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you could only like push out the door or something on Elm Street, and there was something with the liquor there because they're applying for a license uh, that might be a deterrent for Elm Street. So, yeah, they were really looking at uh, School Street, but they were, they were still kind of sussing it out. 
a lot of people we are just telling like telling them hey you have this option to get a parklet right and they they really hadn't thought of it too much before so i think we need to continue doing some outreach uh not only to the uh you know food service places uh but also maybe some retailers who want to put something out on a parking space that, that might be an option as well yeah i think elm street is very tricky for uncommon market because that's also where a lot of people a lot of their customers park to stop and run in and get a soda or a bag of chips or something and so they probably don't want to leave that but yeah that I, i'd suggest we have we have language in in the ordinance that says you know anything outside of the designated area it would be a case-by-case -case basis and you know it might make some sense not to get overly difficult but to have have them come to the council because then other neighbors can weigh in and all that um you know for because anything outside the, the designated area is going to be a little trickier anyway and if it's no big deal then it'll take them you know a two-week cycle to get to the next council meeting and get approved i, I think that's do. right we can jump in and advise them we can let them know if they're going to come to council to run the ideas by us and we'll look at that's what i mean we can help them prepare a proposal yeah. and then let neighbors know so they can weigh in and and otherwise the folks in the area will just do the same as last year i, I would so we wouldn't need the ordinance at all for that i would favor that by maybe by uh, inserting the uh, words by the council in that last line of subsection B after uh, after considered. Considered by the council on a case by case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Jay. Well, um, I guess my question is, and I'm not trying to Stir the pot at all. I'm just really curious about what Connor and Don have heard, and I really want to hear from Wes on this. Um, is is there value in having a conversation around a a quasi permanent parklet versus a pop up parklet? Where if whether you know, I know a restaurant, you can't just like put a bunch of tables out and serve them. You know, serve folks. Um, uh, you know, using using like you know your regular you know protocols, but are is there an opportunity to move the the availability date up early for businesses that might want to be outside on warmer days because they think that they can bring businesses uh, can bring business in before like a May first. Um, so you know, and maybe maybe that's asking too much. Um, maybe that's asking too much of businesses, but ultimately I think that it's up to them to decide, can we, can we open things up where for some creativity, where somebody like an uncommon market could do a quick pop-up and um, sell something outside, you know, they would apply, apply and, and be able to set it up earlier than the May 1st, be able to do something and then take it down uh, at night. And then, you know, if, if there's good weather, um, I don't know, I'm just, I, ultimately, I just like think that it's about connecting with the businesses and giving them the opportunity to be creative and empowering them to be able to, you know, reach customers as best that they see fit. So I, you know, I understand that there's, you know, concerns with public works and snow and all of that, but I just am trying to build in as much, as much flexibility as I think is possible. Yeah. Apparently when you get to the hearing part, I'm I'm in line. Okay. Um so um I, I guess that, so are, I'm trying to um boil that down into like are are you suggesting maybe <clears throat> like changing the beginning the the starting date to something earlier like April 15th or so or um Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but ultimately yeah allowing the flexibility for businesses to be able to pop up and then, and then shut down. Um, you know, Wes may say, Hey, no, we can't, we can't see, you know, customers out there and serve food. Um, but somebody like a common market could say like, Hey, we just got a shipment of seafood. So mm -hmm. why don't we, we have this space. Why don't and it's 
50 degrees out on April 15th. Why don't we go out here, put it out on social media, let people come and, I, and sell something. You know, it's, it, ultimately it's up to them. I, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I'm not trying to complicate things, although I probably I am. Um, but I'm just trying to provide, like, ultimately I feel like I, what I want to do is empower local businesses to do what works for them because every business has their own business model and they interact with their customers in different ways. So if we could, you know, allow some of that creativity and flexibility, then I think that that could be a positive. Yeah. Um, Bill, go ahead. Well, I don't think there's anything that prevents them from doing that now, other than if they have a physical structure that requires movement. The only issue would be what it's going to take, you know, to sort of be around them to protect, to, to you know, there are standards that V-Transit yeah. set for safety. And so I think a business could certainly pop it out whenever they wanted to, if other than the fact that it may not be that easy for them to do to meet all the other standards. But there, there's nothing that says... You know, three penny wants to put it out for the weekends and then pull it in for the weeks. Other, you know, assuming it was easy to do, just you know, and I know theirs isn't, but just you know, there's nothing that prevents them from doing that. It's just, I think, for most folks, once it's out there, they want it out there and using it. But you're right; some some may not. But anyway, I'll, I'll let three penny talk for themselves. <laughs> Go ahead, Wes. I gotta unmute. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, just for quick clarity, the proposal that you are considering right now has the May 1st start date. Yes. Yeah. So I will just strongly advocate for any date. I mean, May 1st is fine. Um, any date before that would be also really, really fantastic. Um, you know, the nature of our parklet is, you know, takes several hours to put together. So, um, and we have to, you know, our, our carpenter, you know, our guy does it. So it, there's a cost to just building it. So we probably with our parklet specifically wouldn't put it in for a weekend and then yank it for a weekend and do that or something. Um, right. but maybe that works for other people's and, you know, I, I got nothing to say about that. It sounds great. Um, but, um, for sure, I'd like to advocate the reason I, uh, you know, listened to Kurt's whole proposal um, and presentation um, is because we uh, we would love to have our parklet out as soon as humanly possible. Um, and, um, you know, towards a little bit of what Jay was saying, uh, at least for three penny, other places have their own specifics. Um, you know, on a day like today or tomorrow, it would be fantastic to just like, oh, it's nice out. Let's throw some chairs out on the sidewalk. And, you know, obviously we have a like a DLC piece to deal with. That's on us. That's not on you. Um, but if we had a blanket space from the city where we could do that, um, that would be really fantastic. Um, but, uh, but just most broadly as far as parklets go we we need we need our parklet out there as soon as humanly possible um and tied in with that while you're talking about it while i have the floor um you know last year uh i think it, it was i don't think it was um october 26th that our parklet was removed i don't know the end date on the current proposal you're looking at um specifically being hopeful, looking ahead with vaccinations and everything else. Like if we had our parklet out on Halloween, that would be really fantastic. And I think that would be really fantastic for the downtown, um, not just our parklet, but everybody. I'm a huge parklet proponent. I think it should just be all parklet. I like, I'm into getting rid of the cars and just all parklets everywhere. But that, you know, that's not what's, uh, that's not what you're considering. Um, but, but I would like to advocate for that. Like I, totally am sympathetic and understanding of the public works and snow removal. Um, but Halloween seems like a fantastic space for us to still have it. Um, and then on the other side, um, you know, I can't promise I, and I won't commit myself for other places, 
but like if we could put our parklet out on April 15th or even 1st, if a foot of snow comes, I will shovel all around our parklet. I like our reality, which I think I even mentioned this, um, you know, some point of the summer when I was on one of these Zooms, um, you know, 50% capacity with six feet distancing, we can't achieve 50% capacity with six feet distancing because of our physical space. Our reality and, um, you know, kudos to both the federal government and the Scott administration, because we have the aid to do this. We've lost a hundred thousand dollars since we took our parklet out. Um, because we can't even, uh, I mean, we, we can't make it with 50% capacity, but we don't even have 50% capacity. So um, we exist because of really tremendous aid that has come our way, um, but we lose $25,000 a month. And um, the best way to stop that until the capacity restrictions are lifted are to get outdoor seating. And so the soonest you will allow us to put it out there. Like I said, I, I will shovel all around it. The plow guys can go around us. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, I just, I, I, I urge you to consider the earliest date possible that is makes sense for you. Yeah. Can thank just, you. Can I just um, wait as a point of clarification oh, yeah, for, for that, just for Wes's. So Wes, you can use the sidewalk as long as there's five, of clearance you can put seats out now uh, or, or during once the season once they set the dates so um so, I, I don't mean to interrupt you bill but uh, we could with the date with the parklet we could then put the outdoor seating on the sidewalk that's i think that's right as long as there's a five foot space yeah but but i think even if even if you hadn't got your parklet out and it was a nice day and you wanted to put seating out you can do that yeah, I don't think that even has to do with this. I think you can do that now if you want. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, um, I'm Donna's uh, next year, but I just want to weigh in on that. I I know we've heard from um, some of us anyway. I've heard from other business owners that are like, "Ah, oh, can you not not have the end date go out so far and just." just so you know where i'm i'm at i i'm more sympathetic to having more parklets all, all the time like that's uh i i think that would that's uh just where where my head is at i i think it'd be delightful to have um parklets uh out during halloween i think that would be great um and i think there's just a question about how we deal with snow on the front end and arguably on in, in october as well but um, but yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm interested in that, but uh, go ahead, Donna. And then, uh, uh, I, I actually, I think then it's, um, Steven and then Jack, uh, you're muted though, Donna. Thank you. I'm sorry. I thought you picked me when you called on Donna Casey. So when there's two Donnas, the last oh. name is really, really helpful. Um, <laughs> I actually was outvoted trying to get it to keep parklets on Halloween, because I think it's a great place for families to crash when they run the street. So I'm with you, Wes. But I do think that if we allow that flexibility, then we're back to something that came up at last discussion, which is enforcement. What if people do it and they aren't out there helping DPW clear the, the, the area? So I think we have to have some muscle behind that just to make sure everybody understands what that commitment is. Because I do want to balance the business needs with our staff and safety. So I also have a concern about, you know, School Street is a great place. I can see Common Market wanting that School Street, but that's a terrible traffic corner. So it has to be done really safely uh, and that people get used to it, that it gets out there and people get used to it. The weather forecast, people say that the 1st of April is going to be really hot and that it's not. <laughs> so we'll see if it stays that way. But it says lots of rain, unfortunately, lots of rain in April that sometimes will be snow. Uh, we did have a discussion about public use, and I didn't see any suggested language here. Um, just that public use after the 
the restaurant, the store is closed. And I would like to have something in there, particularly of the parklets that are more substantial. I understand that I don't want to require people who have to chain their chairs. Um, but if indeed there's a substantial parklet out there, if there's a way to have public use it, I think that would be good if there's some way we could word that. So I just, I'll just mention this again. We talked about this last time is that our, our base, our base parklet ordinance, the, the one that we're superseding with this temporary one, you know, limits the number of spaces and requires a fairly substantial constructed parklet. It, it's got, and in fact, that's what uh, VTRANS and federal highway standards call for. Those are all being relaxed to allow these for now. So many that are out now wouldn't necessarily, even if we had more spaces, that they would have higher construction and safety standards. So, so those are built in a more permanent fashion. So in the underlying ordinance, it does require them to be allowed to be used by the public when they're not being used for the business. We did not put that in these because these are not the same kind of substantial structures. And in fact, in some cases, it might just be someone putting chairs in Jersey barriers out or something. And so the idea was if they've got to chain them up or bring them in, um, it's not the same, it's not the same comparison. So I think if we're, you know, if we're going to require, well, I just think it's a consideration that needs to be thought of what we're asking. We're, we're one hand, we're saying, Bill, Bill, gotta go quick and fast. Right, but there are two types of parklets, but I don't see the language looking at that. I don't see the language saying, this only applies to new, more temporary. This applies only to those who have a more substantial. So there mm -hmm. are. Because, sort of because basically what we've done is we've waived all the permit requirements, even for the ones that existed before, you know, they, they already built them under the old way. So there, there's more to them. I mean, I, you know, I suppose we could grandfather those and say those that existed uh, before, uh, there's only two of them. Um, so, so would we, we require positive pie to make theirs positive pie, Jay accessible Morton, to the public the, the, and not the, anybody else? You know, Jay, the, the one that was at Down Home and that's now Jay Morgan's. Um, I positive, yeah, positive pie positive was the one. Constructed under the prior. Yeah. So, right, it would be those two and nobody else. And, and they understand that. I don't know because we haven't, we haven't required it. We didn't require it last summer. I mean, this is a, this is your call. I'm just. You know, I'm just asking for clarification. That's all. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know that they what whether they understand that or not because we haven't had that conversation at all about this. We just took that requirement out last summer with the temporary rules. My Thank turn. Uh, yes, uh, Stephen, go ahead, and then we'll go. To, uh, I think it's Jack after that, and then Wes. I'm sorry, Jack, you got bumped. Um, okay. So, uh, this is a prime opportunity to get our vacuum cleaners for the sidewalks that we couldn't afford before. We can afford them under with the federal money. Uh, we're going to have potentially this entire rest of this year, maybe even next year, uh, dealing with this pandemic and flare ups. So, we should be really rethinking uh, our outdoor ventilation space. I'd suggest you suggest that we consider eliminating parking on the bridges uh, because the bridges with some of the uh, water fillable Jersey barriers, I don't like the concrete ones, but the, the water fillable orange plastic ones uh, create enough of a safety barrier that those could be kind of city common spaces with some tables and benches inside them. I think, you know, think about doing this as a festival-like atmosphere around the city. I think the mayor spoke to this, that, you know, we've designed our city to be more livable and less traffic uh, and more air. There, you'll get the maximum air circulation ventilation on the bridges because of the cross current. So uh, we could put, we could eliminate the parking spaces on Rialto Bridge, on School Street Bridge, on the Rose Lucia Bridge. I guess that's one. Anyway, there's three bridges that we could do that on. Um, I encourage you to 
make it clear that the when the businesses are closed, you remove the obstructions from the sidewalk, the steel planters in front of uh, Borowser get pushed up against the building, uh, and that it's all public space um, to the degree that the you know, chained furniture can tolerate it. Um, just the idea of putting, like, you're on camera, don't don't walk on my deck, you know, is is not, is, is counterproductive to what, what we're doing here. Um, so uh, I, I don't think we've addressed the issue of the antique store getting uh, invaded by the oversized, more than two spaces, uh, three-penny deck. Uh, if it can move closer to the tree, that's fine. But those are some ideas. If, if, if we can maintain, pay somebody to go around and vacuum, the, the vacuum is three-wheeler, electric, rechargeable, quiet. We can keep our city really clean. We're going to redefine what our future looks like. So think about some publicly owned furnish, furnishings on the bridges, some orange water-filled jersey barriers that sit there all season, um, maybe some umbrellas. Maybe this public works can pick up the umbrellas in the evening. I don't know if you're worried about theft, but I, I think this could be really a, a pivotal time in how we're uh, using our common space uh, out of necessity. So, but definitely don't forget the vacuums. <laughs> okay, thank you, right. Stephen. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Me? Yes. Thank you. This is this is a funny thing, you know. You get into these things, uh, problems of legislative drafting, and you think you've written something and said something clear, and then when you look at it another way, it may not be quite as clear. And what occurred to me as I've gone through this a number of times is that the uh, introductory paragraph says. The regular ordinance is suspended from May 1st, 2021 to October 25th, 2021. But I don't see anything in here that says you're allowed to have a, per a parklet from date A to date B, whatever those two dates are. And except for the ending date of October 25th. And so somewhere what I what I would propose is that we would uh, state a statement, put a, insert a statement that says a parklet may be in place no sooner than April first, and must be removed no later than November second. And the reason I pick the date of November second is that October thirty first is a Sunday this year, and so that if we want to have the opportunity to have them out on Halloween gives the businesses a couple of days after that to take them away. That makes sense to me. Um, and I, I appreciate that we should add that that specificity in there. Uh, go ahead, Wes. Um, why did I want to talk? <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, the language um, non, you know, COVID um, thing about the parklet being uh, available for public space. Interesting to me. And um, those of you who know me might know how much I hate to be the guy who says this. Um, but I'm really curious about like our liability on our parklet becoming a parklet, a public space. Um, you know, the reason that we chose to put signs out that say, this place is being monitored by camera is because we have for our customers chose to put out fairly pricey heaters um, and we were concerned that it's very impractical for us to bring them in and out every day so we left them outside chained up um, and so we we're concerned about that we also um, know from other businesses who had parklets before us that sometimes in the middle of the night when nobody's looking, uh, individuals choose to use parklets as um, places to defecate. And um, 
that and our heating units um, and our tables chained up made us feel like we should put a camera on this so that we can cover in case something happens. Um, but all of which ties, I'm a huge proponent of public spaces. I'm more than glad for people to use our parklet as a public space at night. I also have some, uh, you know, like, I got to like put on a weird business owner hat and say, like, I have some concerns about that um, from a like liability perspective, as well as a, like my staff showing up in the morning and cleaning up feces. Yeah. So that feels like it's worth uh, you know, addressing further and it feels like it's worth um, a deeper, like a longer conversation. And that, so uh, tell me what you think about this team. It, it's some of these things that are coming up, I feel like are issues that maybe need to be addressed when we get back to what is what is our permanent um, uh, parklet ordinance? And that some of the this is maybe not going to be resolved uh, tonight and maybe not be resolved uh, in time for the beginning of this season, um, but should be addressed when we get back to like post COVID uh, times. Um, but the things. But unless unless we want to get into it tonight or before at another hearing, because we're kind of running out of time, um, and I'm I'm happy to do either. That would be a thing that, you know, having having heard a little bit more about that, I feel like I I would be willing to like just put that on hold for right now um, and not like leave the ordinance as it is, um, flag it for some further conversation, but. Uh, but it's but if we were going to pass something tonight, I feel like there's uh, well, Jack has already made a suggestion around the beginning and ending dates. <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's any other issues that like we need to take up tonight. Um, and I don't I don't know. But uh, Dan, I saw your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean we're also talking about expanding the sort of uh, footprint of the parklet to include Elm Street and or. Oh, Portland. that's right. That's right. Um, yes, but I, yeah. I, I would agree that, you know, this issue about do parklets constitute public or private spaces or some quasi public space that can have limitations on it, I, I, I think is a much deeper conversation for another day to, to dive into because I think there are certain certain restrictions. I mean, this, this gets into um, what is our control over public streets. Um, and because we're essentially allowing people to put, um, put these, these parklets into public streets under our authority as managing it in conjunction with obviously VTRANS. Um, but, you know, it does create that question of if, if it's a public street, and we allow this, are we creating a, a semi-private space that an owner has a right to restrict some of the access to, um, you, you know, because we do have the authority to do that as, as the control. But, you know, I think what's, what's evolved over time are things like the positive pie, where, you know, when, the, when they close for the night, people sit there um, and there aren't spikes on the seat to stop people from sitting there. And, like Wes described, where, you know, they take pre preventative steps to sort of protect their investment. And I think those are reasonable. Um, and the cameras are, you know, certainly closed circuit cameras are all around um, pointing at public spaces. Um, so I think those are all reasonable. But if we want to get into sort of that, that depth of discussion, I think that's for another day. I think the, the real question for us, at least, is is should we renew this park ordinance with the changes that Jack proposed and, you know, expanding the footprint, uh, both of which I'm comfortable doing. 
Uh, Lauren and then Jack. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable moving ahead with the changes that have been suggested tonight and leaving the public space issue for another night. Um, one question I had that came up last time, um, but I think it's for Bill. So if, if in this initial outreach, we had kind of raised the question of how much interest would there be in this? And it gives you a lot of discretion, which I think is fine. I'm just like, is there, if there ends up being, you know, a huge amount of interest in this, do you feel like you have enough guidance for like, where is that cutoff? Like it's, it's like there's, there's access and public safety and some other kind of criteria you could use. Like, is it, and, and we could do this another night if you think more guidance, but like, you know, it's like the 10th person who applies, you're gonna be like, it's just too much now. And like, but then how do you let well, them know that they've, they've now hit the threshold of accessibility or whatever? Like, do you have, do you feel like you know, like more well, or less like the- Yeah, I mean, so I think it's, I actually do feel like it's, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, we don't have a, a limit per se. And I think, you know, this is based on the assumption that parking demand is going to be still down and we have parking lots and other places, you know, maybe hopefully not as dead as last summer, but it won't be, you know, the full thriving uh, scene that we've seen. So we're, we're changing parking for, for these kind of uses. Um, you know, it's got to be within two parking spaces of their own business. It's, you know, we have uh, the right to sort of say no if there's, you know, like someone mentioned a turn, you know, bad turn, dangerous turn, uh, sight distances, you know, I think we have to put public safety first. So the, the whole process, and I think, you know, Wes can tell you from his experience, and if he disagrees, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing is, you know, someone expresses interest and we, our folks go out with them and talk it over and look and say, what are your issues? You know, what, what's going to work here? What isn't going to work here? Where's the best place for this? What's, and, and then we try to work with them to come up with a successful project. And, um, you know, some people just, you know, you can't, some people just won't have the space in front of them, whether the streets are too narrow or whatever. Um, you know, and I think even when we talked about Langdon, the reason, the reason we took out a lane of parking on Langdon was that we allowed the parklets to go out into the street. And I think what we decided last time was we weren't going to do that this year. People got a parklets on Langdon, they could use the same two parking spaces as anybody else which means then the street should be able to function as a normal street. Uh, and, and I believe that was the conversation that was held with the Langdon Street business people and they understood that and were fine with that. So um, I, think, I think it's okay. I think changing the dates to whatever you want is great. Um, I, I'd suggest, you know, Jack had, had talked about the language, rather than expanding the footprint that we, we just live that we bring anything outside of the designated area to the council on a case by case basis. Cause that allows us to really work even harder with somebody to make sure our safety and quirky things. So rather than blanketly adding Elm street or other streets, just leave it the way it is with the opportunity for someone to propose something and we'll, we'll look at it. How do folks feel about about that? Or would you prefer to just add Elm from either the whole thing or just a section? Uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I, I I'm I'm comfortable adding Elm. Um, you know, basically from School Street to State Street. Um, but um, you know, if, if it if it didn't pass, I think it would just make more work for us um is all it it just strikes me that the for the same reasons that a parklet works on state street or on langdon street it would work on elm street mm -hmm. um others uh jay well i wonder um if, if we did expand the range are these things that have to be council decisions could we empower bill and donna dpw to you know make assessments on what is you know, appropriate and safe to be able to make a decision quicker than what could potentially be up to two weeks or longer um, as far as making a decision. I, I'm with Dan, I'm comfortable with expanding um, that that stretch from Elm down the state, um, from or on Elm from school down the street, but I wonder about the expediency of being able to make these decisions. Do they have to 
um, specifically come to council. So the thought was that for things outside of the designated zone, yes, because, because people, neighbors and other stakeholders may not, you know, aren't really put on notice if it's not in the regular zone that this is a potential. So they might want to weigh in. You know, we've seen places, uh, cases in the past where neighboring businesses weren't happy that parklets went in and felt that they didn't get a chance to you know, offer their opinions. And so, you know, we want to make sure we're hearing from people. Um, but however you want to handle it is fine. I, Elm Street, you know, we haven't vetted well Elm Street in terms of traffic and it, it is, it's got a slightly different character than state and Maine. So I, you know, I don't know. And, and I don't know if we'd want it, you know, if you say straight from State Street with that first block uh, near the post office and uh, the courthouse, I mean, is that really, uh, you know, I don't know. I think we'd want to take a look and see, do we talk about both sides? You know, I don't know. I'd have to look where there's even parking um, there. So, uh, Donna Bate and then Jack. Uh, I feel if we add Elm, we need to add school. And then I hear Bill talk, and I think that we need to do a better assessment of Elm and school and bring in the neighbors. And that it can come before the council, either our next meeting or our first meeting in April. They might not get the first one, but they can have it. If it moves ahead, then they can have a chance to have it pretty soon. I also think realistically, um, you know, who are we really talking about, right? We're talking about possibly two or three businesses um, on school, none except for Uncommon Market, right? And um, unless you go down to the other end of school and Mangies or somebody wanted to put out a park, in which case it's nice and wide there. So, you know, I think the case by case might not be that big a deal. Um, and maybe, maybe we could figure out a way to expedite that or, you know, so it doesn't have to wait for the council, but, um, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit. I mean, just cause someone wants to do it, then they've got to figure it out. They've got to, you know, I think we could move it right along pretty quickly. If I but, could just jump in on that and mention to everyone that we did stop in every food service and restaurant that was open. There are only a few that weren't. And there aren't, there are a number of um, entities that do not want to do a parklet. They were very clear, they're fine with what they have. And so there's only a handful, Connor, you can jump in on this too, but I think we only heard a handful of people saying that they would be interested who hadn't been, um, thinking about it um, last summer. So I don't think it's going to overwhelm. Um, it, it, I don't think that the number of entities that will come forward will overwhelm the council or um, us to have preliminary conversations with them. Yeah, I, I would guess you're probably talking about three more than last year. Um, now, some other places that might be a case-by-case -case basis is Donna and I didn't wander down like Barry Street, right? I could see right. Bohemian Bakery, maybe Kismet wanting something. And that's and exactly where we down wanted to put that in. It was those kinds of places that we Sure, sure. And then, and like further down Elm Street, like uh, Birch Grove, you know, right. maybe they would want some. So I, I'd actually, I'd be comfortable with the case-by-case -case basis language. So, uh, and like you... You were not able to talk with um, Hippie Chickpea or Royal Orchid or... Um... No, um, Royal, like, and, and you know, like some restaurants have an advantage over others. Like Royal Orchid can put three or four tables out on a deck. They've got some parking spaces on the side by the, like dry cleaner, you know? Um, so, so they have some options, but if you're talking like Oaks and Evelyn, they got no options, they, they got to go in front. So just for example, none of the three more that you're talking about are in that stretch on Elm Street right now. Um, but not, not that we know of. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, so it just seems to me like as far as Elm Street goes, maybe that's one that like perhaps staff can like look into Elm Street, see if it makes sense. And if, if there's time to check in with, with that crew to see if it, um, if there is interest in that stretch, then maybe we can revisit it. Otherwise, you know, we're, trying to create an opportunity where there's not a need um potentially right now um i saw a bunch of hands um i think it was jack and then dan 
I'll, I'll be quick. A uh, couple of things. Uh, yeah, I think Elm Street is a little strange because on the west side of the street, on that first block, there's no parking. So or where Royal Orchid is, there's no parking. So it's not really, doesn't seem that practical for them to do a, a parklet, parklet there. I I like the idea of doing uh, doing it case by case, approval by council, and to make things productive for the members of the council and the clerk. I drafted language for both of these proposals, and I sent it to Cameron. And so you all have in your inboxes uh, the language for these two proposals of amendment. Awesome. <laughs> Um, Make the motion, Jack. Make the motion. And so I, I move. Well, sh do we need to close the public hearing before I make the motion? Um, I don't know that we technically need to, but I just as a matter of process, anyone have further comments on this before we get to a motion? Well, actually, I so I know I know I'm so, I'm sorry for being a pain and extending the conversation, but I I do want to revisit one thing. Um, the language that you had, Jack, was about April 1st. Is that right? Yes. Um, I want to be supportive of that, but I do want to just talk about what happens if there's a snowstorm, right? That, which I, I feel like is, is likely to happen. I don't necessarily want to be depending on folks uh, to need to go out and shovel. I, I think the thing I'm concerned about is snow plows are out uh i guess this is a, a question for donna bar lucchese um what is a reasonable expectation around um snow plow parklet interactions i think that's the bigger concern and i'll let donna get into detail that to me that's the bigger concern than actually the shoveling out because you know wes's committee is going to shovel out all the parklets in town um uh but it is you know it's night it's dark it's late and there's an obstruction in the street that didn't used to be there and a plow takes it out and um you know there's i think the possibility of that happening is not um none <laughs> you know yeah. it definitely could happen so, so i think so i think there's definitely a risk there I think we have a variety of different types of parklets. So for the pre-made, um, larger, more permanent, sturdy parklets, um, plows can maneuver around. I think the real issue is where there is, you know, a temporary fencing with some tables and chairs that are all linked into those. And then that creates a different um, challenge for the owners of those parklets and some challenge for public works. Um, we might end up, you know, depending on how much snow there is, we may end up um, skirting around that and then requiring some hand um, shoveling by the owners of the those entities in order to to move the fencing clear it away and take care of it so i don't think it's the ideal situation but i think that we would typically also have some forewarning that there's likely snow coming and in that regard I would suggest that anybody who has a parklet that has the movable um, option move that before they close up for the evening. Um, we get those reflective flags that stick up. That right. Know that something's there. Yep. Um, so just thinking about just recapping that. So you're comfortable with the more sturdy structures that the plows will give them a wide berth because they're obviously there. Yep. And understanding that there's going to be probably a, a gap that will be snowy in between the, the road and 
and that uh, structure. I mean, and you could you could put in that. that you know, if you are putting in a parklet, you're that you do accept the responsibility for clearing the snow around your parklet. Uh, if, you know, maybe within a couple of parking spaces. You know, all the your parklet and the two adjoining parking spaces. And if you don't do it, we can always revoke your park, parklet permission. And, which is sort of a, a also a, a, an understanding that we're going to leave a gap. Yeah, but, yeah. So that 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 it would be up to the parklet owner, and that would weigh into their decision whether to push it out on, on April first or wait. You know, that I mean that might be someone who doesn't feel like shoveling might say, oh, "I'm just going to wait a couple more weeks because it's warmer." If you if you're Wes and you're just like. I want, you know, I don't mean to pick on you, Wes, but because I get it, you're, you really need the businesses and you're like, I'll do it. And I get it. We'll have to have people out here shoveling and I'll do it, but it's worth it to us to do it. That's part of your calculation. So I think um, maybe that's the way we go. All right. So just to be, <laughs> just to be clear, um, if the, um, uh, if if a snowplow hit a car, let's say, right, like we, the snowplow would be liable for that, right? And I mean, we we hope that that doesn't. Happen, if the car was in a, in a, if the car was in a proper parking space, in a proper parking spot, the plow and it, it, and it wasn't a parking bin, right? Um, but the, I I assume sort of like. Something similar would be the case yeah, I mean, with it, a with a parklet, right? Like it's on us to not parklet. to make sure to not hit it. Right. Okay, I, I thank you for indulging me in this conversation. I just wanted to make sure that we're really clear about that because, especially if we move it up to April first, like that, these are all real possibilities. Um, okay. Uh, so where where are we at, Jack? Did <laughs> did you uh, uh, again? Any other comments, questions? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I guess um, you know, and I I don't have a I'm not necessarily wedded to the um, idea of um, expanding the footprint to go back to that, but I, I guess I would like to see, um, you know, and it sounds I mean, Donna and um, Connor have already done a lot of this, but that, you know, other businesses that might want these parklets are encouraged to know about them um, if they fall outside of the footprint that we've we've created and kept in place. So, you know, the uncommon market or, you know, whatever business wants to do that knows about it. I can, can I make a proposal? Go back. Um, hold on there, Stephen. Uh, go ahead, Donna, Barla Casey. I just want to, I will make an effort to go back to the um, businesses that we were not, that we didn't get to um, because of timing. Um, and I'll also, I think given all these um, con sort of um, ideas that we've been talking about, whose responsibility things are, I think that I'll develop a draft sheet and run it by Bill um, for all the conditions and what the responsibilities are for the different parklets as they develop their their project um and that way they'll understand from the beginning that they have to if we have snow they have to clear and they have to do whatever they need to do to um preserve um their opportunity um okay yeah thank you um steven do you have any um uh, final thought there i do yeah i've got a uh, a suggestion, a proposal. This is a big enough thing, and you're going to have enough stuff with the money decisions uh, over the next few months to where you don't really want to uh, have a lot of these open-ended discussions for park parklet exceptions on your city council agenda. I suggest that you schedule a special meeting for two hours, well publicized ahead of time, soon, and get the papers to pick it up early and put forth the proposals of what y'all are thinking about and what the implications are. 
It can even be one of Bill's full page, you know, bridge things or and do your front porch for them or whatever. But also ask Public Works to price out the the orange fillable barriers. The idea that if this works, there's going to be so many people downtown that people are going to be waiting in line for outdoor seat tables versus if they can go grab some to-go food and go sit in some of these kind of common spaces on the bridges, you know, at tables. Um, we we may have a, a better uh, flow management with that. So I'm, I, I realize it's not far enough evolved as an idea, but you could price out what those costs and how useful and reusable and portable they are, and you could uh, invite folks to a meeting so everybody's aware of what the implications. These are far-reaching implications. You could sort out the liability issue. If you're in a public street, you're benefiting from the city immunity. If you lock it and don't let people use it at night, maybe you lose your city immunity, you know? So there's enough of this stuff to merit a special meeting, not a four-hour city council meeting, but maybe a two-hour city council meeting, and get the public to really come and weigh in, you know? And that will alleviate a lot. That will save more than that amount of time over the next few months in exception discussion and irate neighbors and everybody else. That's that's all. Okay. And don't forget the vacuum cleaners. Thank you. Okay. Um, any any further comments? Okay, Jack. Um, I would. I had started to draft language that said says what we've been talking about that the parklet owner shall be responsible for sm snow removal for the parklet and the two parking two adjacent parking spaces and failure to remove snow can be grounds for revocation of the parklet permit but i don't i was thinking well that makes things maybe worse for the city administration because every time someone does this uh, public works are, is going to be saying, well, you didn't get your uh, parking spaces uh, shoveled out. And the owner says, it was only half an inch. It was gone by 11 o'clock in the morning. I didn't, it didn't need to be shoveled out. So I think it might be better not to uh, put something like that in the ordinance. It, and so I- It won't be public works. It will be neighboring businesses. Yeah, yes. calls. they right. didn't get it done. It won't be us telling them to do it. It's going to be so and so's got a parklet and they haven't shoveled yet, and people can't come to my, you know, I'm losing a parking space. That's who we'll heal from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is worse. <laughs> but that's why they need to get cleaned out, too. <laughs> okay, snowstorms above two inches have they have to clean. So Maybe we just I, make it as a in a permit condition when we get issue the permit. There we go. That's so I move the two amendments that uh, that I uh, asked Cameron to circulate. I have not actually. Oh, never mind. Maybe I, I did get this. It's from Cameron, not from from you. Right. I'm happy to read them out loud for everybody if you'd like. Sure. Let's just make it really okay. clear what, what it is. First, insert. Uh, paragraph B, a parklet may be in place no sooner than April 1st and must be removed no later than November 2nd and renumber the following paragraphs. And then the second one is insert by the council after the word considered in what is now paragraph B. I'll second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. I'm going to close the public hearing at this point. Um, just to be clear, Jack, this is just a motion to amend. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. All right. So uh, the amendment passes. And so now I think we have to vote on the uh, temporary ordinance itself is their motion. I move we adopt the event, the ordinance as amended. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? 
Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you particularly, Wes, for sticking <laughs> through. <laughs> uh through this to, to I, give us i'm embarrassed to admit how much i enjoyed the legislator <laughs> updating and then kurt's proposal and i, I <laughs> thank you that's great that's, it's a, that's a year of covid but this is a fun night out right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes donna do, do we have to get a consensus on the staff following up on the snow thing we'll take care of it okay We'll let you know. So I, I, it's ten nineteen here, team. I just want to recognize that uh, we have not done committee assignments, um, which is probably not super urgent, but maybe I don't know. Donna, go ahead. Well, the list is really incomplete, and then Cameron sent us another one, but that's the city committees that don't necessarily have all the council committees on it. So I think we should do this next week. None of us are dying about this. We're all... Everybody stay on the same committee until then? Yeah, if we, if we still remember. <laughs> so I propose we push this on until next meeting. That's fine with me. I'm, I don't think we need a motion about that. Um, okay. And so I think that is... The end of our regular business. All uh, right, so council reports. I'm gonna go in the same order unless um, unless folks object. I could go in the reverse order, which would shake everything up. Go for it. Okay, I'm gonna go, I know, I know. I'm gonna go in reverse order and start with Lauren. Is that okay? Whew, mind blown. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, all I was gonna say tonight is Thank you to the voters, really appreciative of having the chance to serve again. And thanks to, there was incredible amount of volunteers and to everyone who stepped up to run for office. And I'm just so grateful to have such an active community that we're part of um, and to be back serving. That's it for tonight, thanks. Great, uh, Jack. Very short, thank you for the voters for coming out and voting for uh, to reelect me, Dan, and uh, Lauren, and support all our budget items. And uh, I would have also want to observe that I thought it was great that we had uh, someone come join us for our meeting, Stephen or Edward Cremo, come and join us and as a potential resident of the city. And I, I Googled him and I'm going to reach out, out to him and just say, hey, if you want to talk about uh, what it's like to live in the best place in Vermont to live, I'm sure we can, uh, any of us would be happy to talk to you. Um, and he really stuck it out for a good long time. I think he stuck it out all the way through the end of the uh, water resource recovery facility discussion, which was really pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, all right, um, Dan. Uh, I'll add to the others. Um, thank you to the voters of District 3 for returning me for another uh, tour of duty. And uh, thank you to the voters of Montpelier for passing the um, our various ballot initiatives and that we put on for the budget. Um, and I'll note that our budget passed by 84 uh, percent bill is that right that statistic 84 to 16 percent yeah which I, I think speaks to the good work that we we put in here um, I'm really excited for the next coming term and um, uh, I'm actually going to start Jay and I are going to start doing uh, weekend zoom meetings uh, with constituents. We did this during the re-election and it was really effective. It completely stole it from Lauren, but, um, and so all credit due to her, but it, it was so effective, we're gonna continue to do that. So we just need to set up a sort of regular time and schedule, uh, but we're excited about doing that in lieu of um, 
in lieu of face-to-face -face contact for the time being. Um, and I guess I just end with one quick, there was on election night, I was driving around collecting my signs. I was driving on uh, Pleasant Street and uh, it, it really is a very beautiful street and staring at, out at the city. We, we just have a, a, an amazing city uh, on either side of the Winooski River. Um, and in these, these quiet nights before it starts to get back to summer and leaf out, it's worth driving uh, on a quiet street and just stepping out and looking out over the, the night sky and cityscape uh, to really appreciate the city that we live in and how lucky we are. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jay. Um, Two quick things. One is, um, I know you, uh, you probably all, well, very quickly, you, you saw an email from Matt McLean and from my wife, Ricarda, that some um, presentations around some uh, research projects that some high school students did this past fall. Um, if you're looking to, you know, kill a little bit of time, um, uh, I encourage you to take a look at those videos. There are um, some really uh, unique and creative ideas in there. Um, around how that we as a city uh, connect with and, and relate to the rivers that 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 are that are part of our city. And so, I, if you haven't yet, um, I would encourage you to you know take a little bit of time and, and go through and watch those presentations because there are some great ideas. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, I realized that this. Uh, with, with this meeting, which was theoretically our organizational meeting for the council year, now marks um, one full year on Zoom. Um, the last time we were in chambers was this meeting a year ago. Um, my only meeting, you know, Dan had a few months on me because he got appointed a little bit early, but my only meeting in chambers, and it was from here on out that we've seen each other and connected e with each other. Um, through these screens. So um, uh, hopefully there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel here. We're starting to see it a little bit more. So I just want to make sure that while I think that there's a lot of value to this, uh, th this allows for conversations and people to be part of conversations and will probably be part of how council runs meetings into the future. Um, as we, as vaccines are more available um, and we can think about being able to be closer. I know we've tried throughout the year and it hasn't really logistically worked, um, but I just want to make sure as we're, you know, as things get a little bit safer, I I'm, I'm just want to make sure that we're keeping and always thinking about how we can sort of set the tone and lead the way for um, being back in person together safely. Um, so anyways, I was just realizing that, that, boy, there you go. It's been a year on Zoom, huh? Wow. Thank you for pointing that out. I hadn't realized that. And that is, it, it is a weird milestone. <laughs> and well, really gosh, weird. yeah. Worth noting, though. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Connor. All right. A few very quick things. Um, Again, thanks to the voters, and it's great to have our three colleagues back here and see their faces this meeting. Um, one thing that I think it's worth mentioning is the uh, voters were receptive to having a cannabis um, retail dispensary on the ballot there. That was also pretty overwhelming. And again, I think the reason that we had the vote early was so we could become engaged in some of the conversations around this at the state level. Uh, Senator Cummings mentioned today that we have S-94, which is pending right now, uh, had a hearing today, and uh, that very well could uh, determine whether we have a new revenue source coming in, if that's the way we ultimately decide to go, and there's many community conversations, I think, to follow on this one, so just something worth keeping an eye on. Um, I've got a couple emails about graffiti in town, and, um, you know, I was doing some research into it. And it's definitely not a, a problem that's unique to Montpelier. You probably read in seven days a few weeks ago. Uh, Burlington's had a huge problem with that. And I think much of this stems from people being pent up, like frustrated. Uh, not a ton to do. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think we should just be blaming angry teens or something on it. 
but there is a uh, possible remedy to this. Cameron sent around an email um, to everybody, so I just wanted to give a plug for her. On Friday, March 12th, 3 o'clock outside City Hall, uh, there'll, there'll be folks volunteering to clean up some of this graffiti. That's a great initiative the, the city's taken there and would encourage folks to, to come out for that. That would be great. Um, and last thing, I uh, we, we, we don't meet too often, but I was at the uh, investment committee meeting um, yesterday. And, and just a couple things. First, we're so grateful to have Kelly uh, Murphy here. She just slid right into it. Um, she's so intelligent in the questions she asks, which probably makes up for me staring blankly at some of these pie charts. Uh, but long story short, uh, you know, we're, we're doing okay, considering like everything that's happened in the last year. Um, investments are holding strong. One thing I thought was interesting, and I sent the mayor a, a note about that, is we chose to divest from fossil fuels, um, but Maple Capital is actually taking fossil fuels out of just about all their portfolios there because they've just not seen the return on that and don't anticipate it being a big money maker in the future. So uh, we did the right thing there, but we also did the uh, smart thing financially. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Donna. I can't believe it, Connor. You didn't mention my ride. So I get to talk uh, about it. Oh, <laughs> the ridership is really doing well, despite the frigid cold, a slight increase. And even more so, there have been more shared rides. So that's really good. And we keep ha looking at more and more people downloading the app. So that shows for future riders. I would like to share a personal experience in that we had water, water breaks here to Monday evening that went through until today we finally got a safe, don't have to boil our water anymore. But what was amazing, my condo I'm on the second floor, I took all these pictures of this incredible crew and all their noisy, noisy equipment from 6.30 in the evening to 1 a.m. I mean, they were out there and it wasn't as cold as it has been, but at 18 degrees or so, that long, it had to be cold. And they had the kind of uh, problems with equipment anybody with a vacuum at home could have. Their big vacuum tubes kept plugging up. <laughs> and you see these guys with a flashlight with their head in the hose trying to get stuff unjammed. <laughs> but, um, and they also had a crane out there lifted, and maybe one of you, Bill probably knows the name, a big concrete fixture that goes down in the hole once they had dug it all out that protects the workers when they're down in the pit. And they lifted it up over all the street signs it was just way up in the air and back down. And then they set it and then they did the work and then they brought it back up and put it in a trailer. It was just amazing. But it also made me think, and I sent Donna Casey and Ann a lot of pictures. I don't know, Bill, if I send to you too, probably. But there were pictures that I think they should do more of that. When they're working, they should take pictures and put it on social media. People have no idea why six guys are out there. But if you watch... You can see what they're doing and how they interface. I think it's a missed opportunity. So I'm advocating for a lot more bragging from DPW in the future when they're doing these projects. It was very impressive, very impressive. Thank you, I got water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that advice, more bragging. We, <laughs> we're doing great work. <laughs> how can we celebrate it more? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, for me, I also want to uh, add my voice to uh, others in thanking voters for coming out to support uh, the budget and uh, and actually, I mean to be fair, all of the, the items. Uh, I'm I'm pleased that all of the items passed, uh, and also uh, I I know I said it at the beginning, but I'm still uh, very grateful for um, the folks who came out. Uh, to to vote and and congratulations to um to uh the folks who were just reelected Warren and Dan and Jack uh it's awesome and uh second thing oh uh on the 24th we have the home energy information ordinance uh coming up i think you all received an email from me that has a, a link to the website uh for MIAC. so it's worth um spending some time just to get familiar with that uh, to, to get educated um, about how that works, what it is, um, 
and uh, the rationale behind it. And we'll we'll have obviously more conversation about that um, next time, but just want to make sure that I uh, flag that for folks. Uh, and then a uh, third thing, um, I just want to go on the record here uh, as noting that since the uh, governor has opened up vaccine uh, opportunities to teachers, I am on the schedule. I'm, I'm going to get my vaccine next Tuesday. I'm very excited about it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm old enough. I've got mine. Oh, nice. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Nice job. <laughs> I don't know what kind they're going to give me, but I'm okay with whatever, um, whatever they want to give me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Um, so anyway, hopefully get some social media posts about that. So um anyway just a note there uh john anything from you uh do we well, need to sign anything well, there we go yeah well uh kevin casey uh emailed me today apparently there's a real immediate need for something to be signed that was in the consent agenda so um that got looped around with uh with mary so i'm in sort of semi-quarantine because zane is one of the uh close contacts in the uh the the high school outbreak and i've been around zane a lot so i'm uh sort of careful i'm sort of not around but uh until i'm sure but um yeah so there'll be that and i'll just make sure remotely that that's over there um yeah. and mary told me or reminded me mary or Cameron, one of them said to be sure to tell you that there is something at the police station already it's already there for you to sign, assuming you pass it. Cool. So or you go, you go over there to sign. That would be great. Well, and I, you know, I also want to thank the voters for three more years. You didn't have a lot of choice, um, but in a way that makes it that much better because you didn't have to bother. So I, I appreciate that very much. I want to thank um, all the volunteers who came out. I just each of these crazy elections over the last year, I have completely misread early on, and this one especially because I had no idea that so many volunteers would show up. I completely, all, I, all my plans were for naught. They totally covered everything. It was great. Um, so you all rock. Um, only other thing I would say is as, con as the discussions about the possibility of a special a uh, city meeting for a bond vote developed to please keep me in the loop because I actually there's a lot of ways that could roll out and I actually have some thoughts on how we might roll that out um, to fit in with some other things and and to to you know maximize efficiencies uh, but that's uh that's all I got thank you uh, Bill well welcome back everybody exciting for work with you all for another year um, also thank the voters for their support of the budget. It's always grateful after all the, the work that we do. Um, to Jay's point, an interesting thing on town meeting night, um, you know, I always go down to see how the vote turned out. And we actually had five city councilors and me all in the same location. There for, you know, some were there voting, some were there to see how they had done. And it was like, oh my gosh, like, look, we can actually see one another in person. I was like, we didn't, for, for the press, we didn't talk any business. We were just so stunned that we were all in the same place in, in person. That, uh, we didn't quite know what to do, but it was fun. Now, hopefully we'll get back to that um, for meetings soon. Other than that, um, I don't have anything else. Great. Uh, all right. Well, I think that is the end of our, our business then this evening. So um, thanks everybody. And uh, have an excellent rest of your night. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Great. Good to see Goodbye. you all. Bye. See you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.